Supremacy Games Chapter 301 to 325 Chapter 301 Forwarding the Plan Forwarding the Plan A couple of hours later Mr. 12's hovercar had reached the Grand Canyon With the hovercar's subsonic speed it wasn't that hard to travel almost 3,000 kilometers in just a few hours. Whoosh! Miss! Pink, I am about to reach the spaceship. Can you open gate 12? Mr. 12 requested with a deadpan expression. Who could blame him though? In the past few hours, he received the scolding of his life from his boss and more awaited him when he enters the spaceship. He got admonished since he didn't use a mask when under public view. That led him to have his non-native identity exposed by Felix. Well, this is what both of them assumed. With such a mistake in such a critical moment, of course, Mr. Gama would be livid. Especially when he knew that the council wouldn't relax their guards anymore after finding out that the last kidnapping attempt was done by a non-native. Their organization wouldn't get found out but the purpose of the kidnapping attempt could be guessed after some investigation. Especially when the other kidnapping attempts on bloodliners would finally be linked to the doing with outsiders instead of natives. From that, the council would conclude the existence of their organization somewhere on the planet and they would take full precaution against them. This required a new plan for the Gamma organization and Mr. 12 was rushing to the spaceship just to join the meeting for it. A few minutes later, Mr. 12 looked downward and noticed that he bypassed a small town. Immediately after, he slowed his car's speed and wore blue glasses. The moment he put them on, a humongous spaceship had promptly manifested miles away from him like it was always there. The spaceship appeared quite massive regardless of the long distance between them. It was pitch black and round like a disc. Since it was parked on its side, it appeared even bigger than it seemed. The pitch black alloy used to coat the spaceship quite resembled the Alexander Kingdom scouting spaceship that landed on Earth during the SG invitation. God knows how could the Council deal with a spaceship of this magnitude. In a while, Mr. 12 reached Gate 12, which was already opened and waiting just for him. The moment his car passed through, he removed the glasses and everything brightened up again. There was only one word to describe the inside of the ship. Spacious. Remarkably spacious. The hovercar appeared like a tiny dot, flying inside a huge metallic city. However, Mr. 12 didn't seem lost as he kept flying towards a specific destination. Before long, he reached a somewhat of parking lot for hundreds of different vehicles. He parked in an empty spot and got outside. The moment his feet touched the black alloy, it moved like a living being and crept up to his back creating a black chair. Mr. 12 sat on it and ordered, Myra, take me to the meeting room. Whoosh! The black chair sped up like a rocket in a straight direction. Even when there was a clear wall in front of it, the chair didn't stop moving. Just as it was about to collide against it, the wall opened up on its own allowing their smooth access. This kept repeating for any obstacle made from that black alloy. Yet, even with this speed and straightened path, it still took Mr. 12 a couple of minutes to reach his destination. Upon seeing a huge gate that had a meeting room sign written in the middle of it, Mr. 12 gulped audibly and walked slowly towards it. After reaching it, the gate automatically opened up, exposing a mammoth black table that was suspended in midair by black alloy chains connected to the walls and ground. Around it, there were exactly 14 chairs which were also suspended in the air. All of them were taken but one chair. Mr. 12 snapped his finger and that chair came down and picked him up. Soon, he joined the silent table with the rest. No one was speaking even though no one seemed missing from the table. Some of them just kept glaring at Mr. 12 with a disapproving expression while some had their attention placed on a man who was watching a live broadcast. He was a broad-shouldered man with a thick grey moustache, no eyebrows, and short hair that was split from half with two colours. Grey and red. He had a dark scar running from his forehead down to his right eye. Since it was easy to remove scars with current cosmetic items, it seemed like keeping it was more of a personal preference. While others were looking at him, 
this man just kept watching that live broadcast which was displaying a hospital. Currently, hundreds upon hundreds of people were gathering behind metallic barriers looking at the hospital with hopeful and worried gazes. This was where the poisoned guests from the banquet were sent. Olivia, Noah, Robert and even the Hiltons were all there, receiving the necessary tests and care. Only Felix wasn't transported here as he was taken to a hidden secure place that no one knew about. Mr. Gama spent the last hours trying to locate him but up to no avail. Soon, he waved the hologram from his face and said the first words since they gathered here for a couple of hours already, the anti-spy rule is truly a pain in the ass. No boss, the entire SG Alliance existence is a pain in the ass. Sigh, if we were in the Dark Ages, the entire planet would have already been taken as a slave. Now? We can't even f asterisking use drones. Our spaceship resources are truly being wasted with the existence of those rules. Everyone clamored on like they were given a royal pardon to speak. Only Mr. Twelve remained quiet as he just wanted to act invisible in this meeting and hopefully, Mr. Gama wouldn't turn his focus on him. Alas, Mr. Gama didn't have plans to waste time on throwing a fit on the anti-spy rule, which made it impossible to rely on any technological device, gadget and machine for scouting the planet. He just mentioned it on the pass after getting annoyed by not managing to spot Felix's new location. Right now, he was just giving Mr. Twelve a chilling look, making him avoid having eye contact with him at all cost. Upon seeing his distress and fear, Mr. Gama sneered, You ought to feel that way after you lost us 200 million SC and even exposed your non-native status. Boss I. Bang. Shut up. Mr. Gama pounded the table with his fist and shouted, How dare you f asterisking speak after failing such a basic mission that we repeated thousands of times by now. Planet after planet. Year after year. Yet still. You make a rookie mistake by exposing your face. No one dared to defend Mr. Twelve or even bothered to think about it since they were also irritated by losing such a huge sum of free money. They just kept watching Mr. Gama going full ham on venting his suppressed rage on Mr. Twelve. By the time he stopped, his throat was as dry as a desert, and Mr. Twelve was on the verge of slipping from his chair due to his sweat. Because of his retarded mistake, which exposed his non-native nature, we are now forced to change the plan. Mr. Gama coughed twice to soothe his dry throat and said, we need to make an early announcement in the next few days if we want the chaos to be as impactful and fruitful as always. The organization members nodded their heads in understanding. Their previous plan was to wait a couple of months until the planet would have more bloodliners with higher integration percentages so when they kidnap them, they wouldn't need to waste too many resources on them. They could just buy them and extract five to six abilities at once. However, they also didn't want to wait for too long since the majority of the first ever Awakeners would have already reached the first stage of replacement. Anyone who reached that stage would have a minimum of 1,200 BF. All it took for the human body to be somewhat bulletproof was having a strength equivalent to 1000 BF. This meant it would be extremely difficult to hunt them down for the commoners by just relying on their firearms. So, there was this perfect calculated period to make the announcement. In Felix's previous year, that period was right after the first supremacy game for Earth. When the Earthlings team got shit on in their first game, Felix assumed that Gamma organization and the rest had invaded the planet due to their weakness getting exposed in the UVR. But in reality, the Gamma organization was already on the planet for almost a year now and the only reason they never wanted to expose themselves was to wait for those Awakeners to reach the best farmable state. That state was being close to reaching origin purity. So far, the average bloodliner on the planet had more or less reached greater purity. If the organization made a move now, they could only secure four abilities instead of straight out six. This signified that they would be required to make those bloodliners integrate to 99% in their spacious spaceship, wasting their time and resources. Too bad, Mr. Gama and the rest knew that wasting those resources was a hundred times better than giving extra months for the council to take the necessary precautions against them. After all, 
they had been relying on this hide-and-wait plan on all of the planets they targeted before Earth. This meant it was already written by thousands to millions of people in the UVR. The Council simply needed to key in the search bar reason for non-natives to kidnap bloodliners from newcomers' planets in the Alliance. After an elimination process, the Gamma Organization's Farming Abilities Plan would be at the top with more soul-chilling results. When the Council sees them, there was no way in hell for them to remain passive and let their bloodliners walk freely on the planet like before. They would simply force them to awaken and also integrate in the public camps until they reach the first stage of replacement. Only then would they be able to leave the camps and move freely. With their bulletproof bodies, it would be almost impossible for commoners to kidnap them since the threat of guns wouldn't really work that well anymore. What's worse, if the council was given those extra months, they could even take extreme measures and ban the civilians from owning armed guns. By then, the Gamma organization would be forced to buy weapons and sell them to commoners as well. Not to mention, those months could allow the council to retract the bloodliners in public and send them to camps, military bases, and such. No matter what move the council made, the chaos from the announcement would be impacted heavily. All in all, the plan must be forwarded and quite soon simply due to one small mistake by Mr. Twelve. I suggest fast-forwarding the announcement to tomorrow for only the dark forces in the planet. And in a week or two when everyone starts noticing the raising kidnapping attempts, we can make the announcement public to make commoners join the chaos. A pink-skinned woman with a bald head and shark-like teeth, proposed with her hand raised in the air. Agreed. I. Agreed. No one rejected the proposition as it had been like this always. Sending their announcement privately to the dark forces on the planet just like they did with the Hiltons. Because they were the ones who were willing to make a move on bloodliners for unattainable resources like longevity potion, higher ranked bloodlines, integration resources, technological weapons, or just gadgets, etc. They knew that making the announcement as public as possible would do nothing but create mass hysteria for no benefits. After all, those normal citizens wouldn't pick up a gun and risk hunting down bloodliners just because someone told them to. Even if some of them wanted to go for it, how could they trust the organization's words? How could they trust that after kidnapping a bloodliner, they would be rewarded with the mentioned items instead of getting killed or thrown to the authorities? That's why the organization always contacts the dark forces first since it was easier to convince them. After those dark forces raise chaos and show the items they received after trading bloodliners for them, the commoners would be left with no choice but to believe in the authenticity of the organization. By then, the greedy ones wouldn't hesitate to pick up their guns and further make the situation more chaotic and dangerous. That's exactly what the organization wanted. Chaos equals profit. Chapter 302, The Hilton's Fate and the Anonymous Savior how about the useless dogs who failed for the second time? A lanky man with wilted leaves growing out of his body asked in a tired manner. Mr. Gama's eyebrows knitted in irritation after being reminded of the Hiltons. When he approached them for the first time, he always believed that they would his greatest hound dogs on this planet. After all, they seemed quite capable from a business standpoint. But after they failed to deliver what they promised, he already gave up on making them his number one native force. Regardless, he still gave them a chance to get back in his good books by kidnapping Felix again. The result? Failure. Although he knew that another party had intervened and ruined their plans, he didn't give a crap. In his eyes, they were given more than three months to make a move again. In those three months, they should have considered all options to make the plan foolproof. If they did so, neither the squad nor Mr. Hire would have gotten killed and Felix would have been in their clutches by now. So, he had absolutely no intentions of giving them a third chance or letting them leave peacefully after F. Asterisking up their last chance of kidnapping Felix while he still had his legendary bloodline. I assume that all of the Hilton's key individuals are currently sleeping in the hospital with the rest, correct? Mr. Gama asked coldly. Yes there is still twenty hours until they wake up. Miss. Pink replied while checking her bracelet. Good, 
I want them to wake up and find themselves in hell. Mr. Gama ordered with a frigid tone, put a $100 million bounty on their grand elder head. $50 million bounty on that kid in the Earthlings team. And the rest of the elders put $20 million on their heads. At last, any group or gang who dared to vandalize their assets would get $1 million. The reason? Miss. Pink asked while copying everything on a hologram. For betraying the planet by aiming to kidnap and harm the captain of the Earthlings team. He smirked cunningly and added, right about the feud between the Maxwell and theirs. Don't forget to post some old recordings of their dealings with Mr. Heyer concerning the first kidnapping attempt and this one. Anything else? Miss. Pink asked without lifting her head. Like always, just make sure that our organization's name doesn't get mentioned in the video or anyone related to it. We need the kidnapping attempts to appear based on hate and feud between their families. He emphasized the last point. Mr. Gama was doing all of this not because he was worried about his organization's name getting known but simply to avoid losing the trust of other dark forces. After all, if they saw the fate of the Hilton's family after dealing with the organization, not a lot of them would be as thrilled as before by working with them. Thankfully, every Hilton who knew about the organization was currently asleep for 20 hours. This meant, they couldn't even switch the blame to the organization privately to ruin their reputation. By the time they wake up, everyone would be either destroying their assets or aiming at their heads. That should be the least of their concern as the moment the authorities watch those recorded videos of their deals, they would be straightaway placed in secure custody until they wake up and interrogate them. As for Adam? He would have his abilities extracted so he wouldn't cause trouble and then get placed in a special solitary cell just for bloodliners. Obviously, he would be removed from the team and replaced by the lucky 101 ranked bloodliner in the list. The terrifying part? All of this would be happening during their sleep unbeknownst to any of them. Just like Mr. Gama said, by the time they wake up, they would see themselves in hell. T.I. Ring. Done, I have posted it on the internet, the dark web, and sent it to every media station in the world. Miss. Pink waved the hologram and added, I mentioned that they just need to show proof of their work and send it to my Earthling's email. Good. Everyone would be skeptical at the start but as we send the money, the rest wouldn't hesitate anymore. Mr. Gama knocked on the table with his finger twice and said, Now forget about those useless dogs. We need to find out who intervened in our plan. How could we find him? The lanky man smiled bitterly, the bracelets of Mr. Hire and the squad were broken apart, and Mr. Twelve didn't see him. With the anti-spy rule blocking us from using satellites, drones, and hacking in the Earthlings ones, we can't find him unless he spoke out about the rescue by himself. Everyone went quiet after hearing so. As much as they hate to admit it, the lanky man claims were all correct. They might possess the technology and resources to find out who did it, but with their transpassing status, they couldn't be used at all. Heck, they actually were allowed to do only one thing with their massive spaceship, and that was landing on the planet. Anything else was completely against the rules and with the queens breathing down their neck, they couldn't even use a drone sneakily. Are there any good guesses? Mr. Gama coiled the end of his mustache on his finger and said, from the massacre scene, there wasn't any use of elemental abilities. The battles were up close and quick. Boss, I doubt there were battles. Miss. Pink placed a holographic image of the massacre scene in the center of the round table and zoomed on the severed heads and Mr. Hire's cleaved arm. Look at how smooth they got sliced. It's just a single straight line. This meant, they were ambushed swiftly and they didn't realize it even when the deed was already done. Indeed, there was a huge gap in strength. This eliminates the doing of commoners and those below first stage of replacement. A mellow voice escaped through the lips of an obese man with long black hair reaching under his seat. We know that in this planet, first stage bloodliners are not that many. Mr. Twelve scratched his chin and reasoned, since the known first stage bloodliners in American were all poisoned in that party, this leaves us with only the unknown ones. They are definitely not a lot. 
To further limit our options, we just need to look for a physical type bloodliner or someone who uses sharp weapons. He slash she needed to be in Boston. Even if we find one, it just didn't make sense how they managed to locate the drop spot and reach there in only a couple of minutes, kill everyone, tip the police and leave in under four minutes before Mr. Twelve reached the scene. Miss. Pink shook her head, I just don't see an earthling and even a junior being able to pull it off. Are you suggesting non-natives? The lanky man denied this option the moment he said it. It can't be. After all, he would be restricted by the rules just like us. Miss. Pink shrugged her shoulders, he could have provoked them to make the first move. Possible. Not. Everyone is as retarded as Mr. Twelve to fail in such a simple baiting attempt. Indeed. F asterisk CK all of you. Mr. Twelve flipped them both of his fingers. Bam. Seeing that the atmosphere was shifting away from the conversation, Mr. Gama banged on the table and gave out his own opinion, I don't know about some random non-native, but I am quite positive that the other five organizations didn't have a hand in this. He waved Miss. Pink's hologram away and placed five separate ones each showing a different planet. Some were small and some were big. Ones had almost the same gentle atmosphere as Earth and others were more or like Mars, red and gloomy. Omega is having its entire forces focusing on farming Groivivar planet. Delta is on the verge of detaching from Mistrona planet after they terrorized all of the commoners from awakening. Moonark and Blazers are currently in a war to conquer a deserted planet that was found to have a mine-producing medium-grade fire stones. Mr. Gama removed the rest and left only one grey planet which seemed extremely cloudly. He then enlarged it and said, Gravefoot organization had just targeted this new planet which joined the Alliance. It is expected they will stay there for a couple of years just like us. So unless they sent some of their members here and kept them hidden in other continents, I doubt it would be them. Mr. Gama closed the last hologram and said, For now, place 95% of your focus on the announcement and the upcoming batches of bloodliners. As for 5%, Keep always in mind about trying to locate the identity of that rat. Find. Authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number S fate and the anonymous savior underscore 520910057547364353 for visiting. Boss, are we giving up on the legendary bloodliner? Mr. Twelve couldn't help but ask after seeing that Mr. Gama didn't mention Felix throughout the entire meeting. After all, he boasted to Felix that they would be getting into him no matter where he hides. What other option do we have after your F asterisk CK up? The pacified Mr. Gama was immediately set in flame after being reminded of Felix's situation. Who would dare accept breaking into the Earthling's headquarter base to catch him? We don't even f asterisking know where it is. How could others know? Mr. Twelve lowered his head and gazed at the table, not daring to respond or meet Mr. Gama's furious glare. However, he still murmured with bad intention, let's at least place a heavy bounty on his head to make him feel tensed around people within the base. Um. Mr. Gama thought about it for a few moments and shrugged his shoulders, indeed. We might not get into him anymore but we can at least make his life hell in the Earthling's headquarter. Mr. Gama snapped his finger at Miss. Pink and ordered, place a tier 1 legendary bloodline on his head. Make sure to add that the bloodline would be of their own choice. Miss. Pink chuckled and added the bounty on a long list that had thousands of rewards with the correspondent prices next to them. The prices would definitely set the council aflame if they saw them. For a simple reason, the currency used was the number of bloodliners and their strength. At the very top of this list, Felix's name had been added plus the reward next to him. After seeing that the list was almost complete, Mr. Gama excused everyone from the table, go ahead and get busy, tomorrow is going to be a long one. Yes, boss. Chapter 303, The Earthling Team Headquarter Meanwhile up in the sky, in a military plane that was being guarded by two jets, Felix was leaning against the window while having a hologram in front of him. 
Five hours had already gone by since the moment he got rescued by the SWAT team. In the first hour, Felix was questioned about what happened in the banquet before he got poisoned and after it if he managed to wake up during the kidnap. Felix didn't let go of this opportunity to accuse the Hiltons with a couple of lies mixed with truth. For example, he told the authorities that before his eyes closed shut due to the poison, he noticed that Adam was staring coldly in his direction. To make them believe it, he showed them the recording. This wouldn't have appeared strange at all if Adam wasn't known for being the friendliest and warmest person on the planet. Felix even showed them past recordings from the preparation camp where Adon was always treating him nicely no matter much he ignored him. With those contrasting emotions and one even shown right before the poisoning, doubts were rose successfully in the mind of the authorities. But just doubts. That's exactly what Felix wanted. For the Hiltons to be suspected since he knew that the Gamma organization wouldn't forgive them for failing two times in a row. Plus, Mr. Gamma needed an outlet to vent and the Hiltons were in his crossfire. At that point in time, Felix didn't really know how the organization would punish the Hiltons, but he knew that it was going to be public. When that happens the authorities would have no choice but to truly start suspecting the Hiltons. Yet, Felix didn't think that organization was actually going to leak recordings of their deals with Mr. Hire. Currently, he was watching those leaks which had gone viral since the moment they got posted half an hour ago. The content was mind-blowing both to Felix and the viewers. While the viewers were shocked by the hidden agenda those Hiltons harbored for Felix since the national tournament, Felix was left in surprise at the organization's wit. He noticed that the videos were filmed from the chest of Mr. Hire and not his eyes. This meant, he was relying on a tiny camera instead of the Queen's recording system. It was a known fact that anyone with a bracelet on could record everything he sees with his eyes only. The process was simple actually. One just needed to request the Queen to record and everything that he sees would be seen by the Queen as well. While his eyes send the information to his brain for processing, they also send the information to the Queen. She would process it and turn it into usable data. Then send it back in his bracelet's storage. Just like this, everyone with a bracelet was a walking camera. This meant when the Hiltons signed a non-disclosure agreement with Mr. Hire, he mentioned only the ban of the Queen's recording system and not externals. Felix was certain that it went like that as there was no way for the organization to leak info like this without worry about breaking the contract. Felix didn't know if the Hiltons were stressed during the signing or simply didn't know much since they signed with Mr. Hire almost a year ago. Whatever it was, this deadly term had f would them pretty badly as those leaks had reached the hands of the ESG organization and the government. Adding what Felix said about the Hiltons to the mix and a first suspect was born. Felix didn't know what they would do to them and he honestly didn't care much if they put them in jail or straightaway executed them after getting all the information from them. In his eyes, they were going to die in both situations since those heavy bounties on their heads were bound to move some daredevils. Heck, even bloodliners with assassin abilities wouldn't hesitate to go for an attempt. So, jailed or not, they were dead meat anyways. The best part he didn't need to make a move or waste his time dealing with such pests. After all, the moment Felix got the Gamma's spaceship coordination, he deemed them as a useless piece in his board. If it wasn't for him being currently taken to the Earthling team headquarter as fast as possible, he would have dealt with them personally. Naturally, the ESG organization wasn't just taking Felix to the Earthling team headquarter but every team member around the world. This assault had shaken them greatly and especially when they realized that it was the doing of a non-native. If they weren't worried about Olivia and the rest's health being affected during mid-flight, they would have taken them as well instead of leaving them in the hospital. Obviously, before boarding the plane Felix had to sign an NDA contract that forbids him from exposing the headquarters position. This pretty much messed up with his upcoming deliveries since giving the coordination of his position to Badadai would be breaking the terms of the NDA contract. The only way to modify those terms was by asking Mr. Roger Gass personally. Too bad, he was currently occupied with this mess. Soon, Felix removed the hologram from his face and closed his eyes shut. 
He wasn't told when the plane was going to land or where. But it was already in flight for four hours now and only the ocean was greeting his eyes from the window. He guessed that the plane was on top of the Atlantic Ocean since Boston was facing it. If they went west, he should have seen the lights of towns and cities they pass by. Hopefully, the headquarters isn't going to be in the Great Sahara. Felix mused one last time before closing his eyes, wanting to take some rest. It was already past midnight and he was quite tired from everything that happened so far. But it was all worth it. Find authorized novels in faster updates, better experience. Please click number. Underscore five two zero nine eight one seven eight zero eight one six seven two seven eight zero for visiting. After seven hours of flight, Felix was finally alerted by the Queen that the plane was landing. Felix opened his eyes groggily while yawning two times in a row. Oh. They chose an island. Felix glanced outside of the window and noticed that the plane was actually gliding towards the ocean. Forget about land, there wasn't even a single rock in sight. Yet, he wasn't scared at all but just slightly surprised by the ESG organization's choice. Before he could think too deeply about it, a humongous blue dome suddenly manifested on the plane's gliding path. The moment it appeared, it started withdrawing from the top to the bottom exposing what was hidden within it. Felix couldn't help but nod in satisfaction at the sight of a wide spherical island that appeared like a beautiful forest of woods mixed with a forest of metal. He could see that some buildings were still in the process of construction while some were already finished. The most eye-catching building was the one in the center of the island, attracting anyone's focus on it by its unique and futuristic design. It was shaped like a drop of water on the ground, smooth and wholly transparent. There were no windows, roof, and entrances. Yet, Felix was able to see some buildings inside the dome. If the plane wasn't getting closer and closer to the ground, making it impossible for Felix to focus on the building, he would have gotten a closer look at everything inside. Soon, TS 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 TS. The plane had successfully landed on the runway while the accompanying jets waited for their turns to land. They needed to refuel for their journey back. Captain Felix, welcome to the Earthling Team Island. The moment Felix disembarked from the plane, he was greeted loudly by tens of people wearing a single formal uniform that had the planet's flag on its chest and staff on its back. Felix nodded his head in appreciation and started inspecting the airport while walking towards them. It seems like they invested heavily in this island. Felix thought so after seeing fully automatic hover vehicles passing back and forth in the airport robotic arms loading packages or unloading them, and especially when he lifted his head and saw the blue dome was active again. He knew that the vehicles and bots were quite cheap in the UVR but the protection slash anti-surveillance shield was nothing but that. Its cost was ranging from 10 million SC to billions SC, depending on its generation, effectiveness, the size of the land used on it, and most importantly the shield strength. Felix didn't know which generation the ESG organization used for the island but he could guess that the price would surpass 300 million at least to cover this white island. Speaking about the island, Felix realized that this wasn't its real shape or size since he could see that the borders of it weren't a beach or even a natural ground but a hard metallic-like material. This made him conclude that the island was extended by relying on artificial land to provide more space. Heck! He could see at a distance some robots pouring from a huge container a silver liquid into an empty square-like platform that was linked with the border of the island. It was evident that the ESG organization wasn't planning on stopping the enlargement of the island. It seemed to Felix that they were planning on turning this island into the first advanced technological city in the world. Albeit it wouldn't be open or seen by the public but it was still the best place to truly experience some technologies of the universe. Since this city was in international water, it belonged to the council as a whole and not just a single country. Only due to this was it possible for the ESG organization to pour in the resources of the council into this island. Felix was glad about those modifications as he was going to spend the next months on it. Chapter 304, The Planetary Supremacy Games A delicate girl who was wearing thin glasses and light makeup approached Felix and bowed her head respectfully. 
She then gestured with her hand at the entrance of the airport terminal, Captain Felix, please this way. I will be taking you to the drop where some of your teammates are currently gathered. Thank you. Felix stopped glancing around and went with her to the semi-empty terminal. It was packed only with staff members and bots doing their thing. After Felix got checked out for security reasons, they got out of the airport and went to a hovercar that was already waiting for them. The moment Felix got comfortable in the back seat, he was asked by the guide, Do you want a slow ride to look around? Felix nodded his head and opened the window slightly. Felix immediately smiled with a pleased expression after seeing that the gentle atmosphere and fresh air of the island still remained intact even though half of the island had buildings on it. He always loved nature, open spaces, and fresh air. This island was delivering on all of them due to the advanced technologies used which didn't rely on polluting resources. Felix believed that everything was using electricity as an energy source and electricity was probably being harnessed from the miniaturization nuclear batteries. Each battery could potentially power up the entire island for tens of years if the consumption was centering around providing energy to light up the buildings, charge the vehicles, etc. Those batteries might sound astonishing and expensive but in reality, the technology of relying on nuclear energy as a source was outdated by at least hundreds of thousands of years. Don't even mention the metal race, who God knows what kind of energy source they were relying on, just advanced planets in the Alexander Kingdom were using those batteries only as a backup measure. This meant the technology to create those batteries and even nuclear power stations weren't actually restricted like the majority of them. If the ESG organization was willing to pay, they could easily buy the technology and solve the planet's climate warning and other issues which were threatening the livelihood of citizens. However, Felix knew that the ESG organization wasn't aiming at pulling their entire resources and focus on outdated technology since they would be forced to change it again with a better one. They wanted to straightaway start right as closely as possible to the top of the technological tree so they wouldn't need to be chasing behind the other civilizations all the time. That's why even though a year and a half had gone by since the invitation, the planet wasn't really showing in technological advancement. Felix knew that the ESG organization was betting on doing so by relying on the Earthlings team. Why? Because the reward from winning a planetary game was a wish that could affect the entire planet. While in individual games, a player could wish for something that he needed with a clear limitation based on his rank, the PSG had the same concept but the planet was the actual target of the wish. For example, if the Earthlings team won the first game, the wish requested could be, asking for a large discount to buy either medical substances, potions, vehicles, space.i.p.s, UVR tower signals, etc. On the other hand, they could totally ask to get access to the Alliance's restricted technologies. Whether in the military industry, medical industry, mining industry, space exploration industry, and many more industries. Felix still remembered the first wish the Council had chosen when they barely won their third game. It was getting access to the blueprint of Moon's surveillance tower. If it wasn't for the Gamma organization still rampaging on the planet in that period of time, the Council would have wished for something else more useful. However, they were left with no choice but to wish for that tower since it would allow them to scan for a large-sized spaceship on their planet's soil. They were that desperate to find the coordination of the Gamma's spaceship. Since it was their first game, the wish was quite limited. Thus, they only got an average generation blueprint and they still needed to purchase the materials and hire the working hand to build it. However, no one was complaining since if it wasn't for the PSG platform, the Earthlings wouldn't have obtained it in probably even hundreds of years. The best part about all of this was the fact that there were no limits. Like, they wouldn't be able to wish for some technology that was on the Alliance restricted database even though their wish was enough to get it. That's due to Earth being a member of the Alliance and subjected to its rules just like every other member. This meant it's impossible for another member to interfere in their wish and stop it from happening. Especially with the existence of the unbiased Queen AI, find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number, 
underscore five two zero nine eight one nine zero nine six six five seven six zero one one for visiting. Those bullying situations were not utterly uprooted, but they were lowered to the bare minimum with the Queen's supervision. In other words, Earth might be currently just a particle of dust within the behemoth body of the Alliance that encompassed the majority of races in the universe. But it had its own rights, just like every member of the Alliance, whether at the peak or at the bottom, just like them. However, the Alliance didn't send the invitation to join them since they were in desperate need of members or something like that. They did so to give them a proper chance of fighting for their lives instead of getting invaded and bullied straightway due to their lack of technological advancement and such. The Planetary Supremacy Games was obviously the platform where they would be fighting to prove their worth and rise above the rest of the Alliance members. The ESG organization and the Council didn't just invest everything in the team for no reason. They did so because they knew that the planet's existence and their citizens' freedom was relying on the results of their representing team. If it wasn't for so, Felix and the rest of the team all around the world, wouldn't have been given those nanosuits or get transported straight away to the island right after the attack on Felix. The ESG organization knew that they couldn't afford to lose any of their strongest members just a few months before their first game. Currently, those team members who were living in countries near the island had already reached it hours ago and were waiting for everyone to group up. Twenty minutes later, the hovercar had slowed its speed even lower after reaching the transparent sealed building. So this is the drop. Felix wondered while sizing up the colossal building up close. He was informed on their way that this building was called the drop and it had been designed by a somewhat famous non-native in the UVR. The design was actually marvelous since the transparent material was allowing those on the outside to see within and those on the inside to see out. This was controllable. All it took was a simple request from the AI and the transparent material would turn milky white on the outside blocking everyone from looking at the inside. This way, everyone in the headquarter would be enjoying the natural sunlight and beauty of the forest surrounding them while at the same time having full control to block others from spying on them. Plus, the materials used to build it were strong enough to defend against laser weapons and even diffuse nuclear drops. So, it served as a second defensive barrier for the team. Follow me. Captain. The delicate girl smiled politely at Felix while opening the door. After stepping outside, the delicate girl didn't walk straight to the building, which was still further away but went to step on a square like platform that was black in color compared to the white ground. Oh. They even added hover platforms. Without being told what to do, Felix straightaway went to another black square and stood on it. Then, he turned to the delicate girl and asked, What's the activation sequence? The captain is really knowledgeable. The delicate girl praised with a charming smile while tapping her heel five times quickly on the center of the platform. Immediately, the black platform rose half a meter above the surface and kept hovering like that silently. Felix swiftly did the same and his platform rose to equal height. Upon seeing so, the delicate girl tapped once in the front and a folded black bar rose slowly from the same place of her tap. It kept unfolding as it got longer until it reached the waist of the girl. Then at the top of it, it unfolded on both sides, leaving behind scooter-like handle grips. The girl pressed on a green button and her bracelet got connected with the platform. By connecting it, the queen could now control the platform which translates to giving the girl the ability to control it with her mind. Felix did the same and asked the Queen to take him to the building at a moderate speed. As he was moving, he couldn't help but notice that most staff members near the building or even inside the building were using those platforms instead of walking. They were quite fast as they had reached the transparent wall of the building in merely a couple of seconds. The girl swiftly went ahead of Felix and faced her bracelet screen at the wall. Immediately after, a sky blue light beamed into her bracelet screen for a split second before withdrawing. Then, a portion of the wall slid to the side providing access to both of them. However, the girl didn't move as she gestured with her hand for Felix to do the same. Captain Felix, you can't enter the building with me unless you had been given permission. Before Felix could ask about it, the delicate girl clarified, 
Mr. Rodriguez had already linked your UVRID with the building AI. Since you are the captain you actually possess control over the building only lower than the AI and Mr. Rodriguez. Oh? Not bad at all. Pleased, Felix smiled faintly while extending his bracelet to the wall. After it got scanned by the same blue light, Felix was informed by the Queen that his bracelet had been connected to the building and he had obtained level 5 clearance. Do you want an explanation on your level of control in the building? The Queen asked. Just give me the important ones. Felix replied and chased after the girl who went through the entrance. You are allowed to enter 99% of the buildings, you can give access to non-authorized individuals, and lastly, you can control the transparency of the walls. Sweet. Felix grinned widely after hearing the last clearance. Chapter 305, Meeting the Team the girl didn't stop to introduce the areas and buildings inside as she merely kept heading in a specific direction. After a couple of turns through the narrow streets between the buildings, they reached an open area where multiple couches, chairs, and even beds were placed in random positions. Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number. Underscore 520982003618170012 for visiting. Most of them were already taken by boys and girls wearing the Earthling team uniform. The delicate girl stopped at once and informed Felix, please wait in the lounge for the rest of the team members to arrive. She looked at her bracelet and said, the latest one would be arriving in two hours. Until then, enjoy the presence of your teammates. The girl left behind a polite smile while turning around, planning to return to the airport and guide the newcomers. Felix glanced at her back for a second before turning around and focusing on his teammates, who were all staring at him in silence. Not feeling awkward at all, Felix showed his trademark easygoing smile and hovered in their direction. After reaching them, he jumped from the platform and it flew back automatically. Is there any empty seat? Felix asked casually while glancing around, seeking a vacant chair or even a spot on a couch. Captain Felix, Please take mine. Sophia Schmidt stood from her chair with a gentle smile and said, I assume that you didn't get a minute of rest after everything that happened to you in the US. Captain Felix truly had it tough in the past hours. The balls on those Hilton's bastards are truly astonishing. They might have balls but they sure have no F asterisking brain to target the captain just due to a feud. Sigh, here I was thinking that Adam Hilton was a gentleman. It turns out he was just as much of a snake as his elders. The moment Sophia indirectly mentioned the attack, the awkward atmosphere immediately broke apart as everyone started commentating about it. Some were expressing their anger and fury at Hilton's while some went forward and asked Felix about the experience. After all, they weren't given full details and the information they had was based on what's available on the internet. Sophia winked at Felix after seeing that he was being surrounded by his teammates and went to take an empty chair. Felix smiled wryly at the sight and started pacifying the curious mob by retelling what happened from the banquet to the moment he got rescued. Since he was the captain, it was to be expected that he needed to be nice and agreeable than just a straight-out asshole like always. Plus, he wanted to get rapport with some of them so it wouldn't be awkward every time they meet. Just like this two hours went by and the remaining teammates had arrived one by one. Sylvia, Zhang Wei, Hina Suzuki, Leo Bridges, and Ea Dafacharia were the last captains who arrived with their national teammates. Just like the others, some of them went and introduced themselves properly to Felix while some asked for Olivia's and the rest's well-being. After conversing for a few more minutes, their bracelets all rung or vibrated at once. Felix excused himself and opened the message that was sent to him by Mr. Rodriguez. After reading it with his eyes he thought, even better, I can start working on my plan now to take down the gamma. He stood up from his seat and said, I will be heading to my room. I still haven't slept all day long. That's unfortunate. A well-toned bronze man with an orange beard sighed, I was planning on asking you for a quick spar. Felix waved his hand dismissively while stepping on a black platform near him, later. After he left, Sophia giggled while looking at the well-toned man. 
Leo, why are you rushing to get beat up? It's called limit testing. Leo Bridge cracked his knuckles in eagerness and said, I already know that I can't win against the captain, but that doesn't stop me from trying to see where I stand against him. As expected of the Barbarian of Australia. Everyone smiled wryly at his weird and too straightforward Mindest. In their eyes, if they knew that it was impossible to win against Felix then it was better to save the embarrassment of losing. Sylvia's fate in the competition was still fresh in their minds. I believe that Mr. Roger Gass had sent the message to you guys as well right? Sophia suddenly asked, not wanting to dive into a subject related to battles so soon. Everyone nodded their heads and Leo even displayed its content as a hologram. The message wasn't long as it was merely having Mr. Roger Gass apologizing since he wasn't coming to the island today or in the next two days due to Adam's situation. After all, he got removed from the team's temporary until he gets investigated properly. His removal opened up a spot in the team which was being fought for by every council member. While Mr. Roger Gass wanted to simply add the 101 ranked bloodliner to the list, no one agreed on it besides the country that the bloodliner belongs to. They said that each country should fight for the vacant spot to make it fair. Right now, Mr. Roger Gass was being caught up with creating a small tournament that would be hosted in his UVR room and have only 195 bloodliners competing for the spot. This meant, he would be delayed by at least a day or two. Since he was the president of the ESG organization, he was required to be present in the signing ceremony that was expected to be held tomorrow before the Gamma organization messed up with everything. Now, they were told to do as they please in the next two days until he arrives. Anyone up for some island exploration? Sophia asked while stepping on a black platform. I am down for it. Same. I pass, my sleep was ruined by the sudden flight. While everyone wanted to explore the building and the island, most of them still declined the offer and went to their rooms to carry on sleeping. A few moments later, only twenty juniors had followed after Sophia. Meanwhile, on the top floor of a standard residential building, Felix had just got out of the elevator and was currently heading to his room. It wasn't that hard to find out the location of the residential area in this behemoth building that was more of a covering dome than a building. Felix just asked the queen for the directions and she guided him. After all, his bracelet was connected to the AI of the building, so most of the information about it had already transferred to the queen. A few moments later, Felix stood in front of a closed shut door that had his name on it and position in the team. After having his bracelet's screen get scanned by the same blue light, he had gained access to his room. Cluck. The moment Felix opened the door, the lights turned on abruptly, forcing him to close his sensitive eyes. Queen, please leave only one light bulb turned on. Sensing that the light had withdrawn, Felix massaged his eyelids while opening his eyes slowly. Now that his vision wasn't impaired, he was left to enjoy his spacious room, which appeared more like a modern suite in a hotel than a normal room in a standard residential area. Felix didn't know if all the rooms were this big and neat or just him due to his captain status. Whatever it was, he wasn't complaining in the slightest. Before doing anything else, Felix went and popped the cherry of the bathroom by taking a prolonged shower. The one he took after getting rescued was rushed due to the authorities wanting to question him. He could still smell the nasty blood of the mercenary squad in his hair. Forty-five minutes later. Felix got outside of the bathroom while having a towel rolled on his nether region. However, that towel soon morphed into liquid before turning into comfy pajamas. Afterward, Felix laid on his bed and opened an empty hologram at the side. He left it there and asked in his mind, Asna you busy? Watching. Asna replied lazily while biting into a red apple. Do me a favor. Felix requested. I need you to dive in my memories and describe the Gamma organization's spaceship. I only remember that it was coated with a symbiote's dead skin like my new AP bracelet. If it's going to result in watching fireworks, I don't mind doing it. Asna's eyes brightened up after reading his mind and seeing his reason. He he he, don't worry. Felix smirked widely, 
the fireworks will be big enough that a second son would be born from the aftermath. That's what I like to hear. Asna clapped her hands in excitement while closing her eyes, diving into Felix's memories. She didn't need to be told about the period as she read it in his mind. In a few moments, Asna opened her eyes and started describing it. However, she wasn't doing a good job in it as Felix was still having difficulty knowing its module. I think it's better if I just showed it to you. In the end, Asna gave up and created a mirror in her bedroom that was showing the memory of Felix. At loss for words, Felix could only close his eyes and enter his consciousness. After reaching her bedroom and seeing the same mirror as last time, Felix's eyebrows twitched as he asked, If you were able to show me my memories like this why not use it before? Asna smiled cutely and said, I didn't want you to get used to it and work me to death by requests. Lazy bum. Vexed, Felix cursed while pushing her to the side, leaving himself some space to sit in front of the mirror. Play it. Felix narrowed his eyes at the screen and said, whether it's going to be an easy win or a hard one depends on their spaceship's alloy type. Chapter 306, The Symbiotes Asna pressed play on the remote control and laid back on the side, not interested in watching the memory again. Meanwhile, Felix was engrossed in watching what happened in his previous life when the Council had finally requested assistance from the Alexander Kingdom's fleet to take care of the Gamma organization. They already utilized everything in their pockets yet they didn't manage to get rid of the organization. Even when the spaceship coordination was found, they were still unable to damage their spaceship with nuclear weapons or even the purchased ones in the UVR. Not to mention that the Gamma organization was merely one of the six invaders at that point in time. While the other five didn't send their full forces, the Council still couldn't take care of them all at once. After seeing that the situation was deteriorating each day and fighting each other akin to wolf packs, the Council couldn't wait any more for the Earthlings team to reach a good rank. They hoped that it would happen soon, allowing them to wish for some mass destruction weapons that were strong enough to take care of the invaders, but the team was always losing three games than winning one. Thus, they voiced their plea to the Alexander Kingdom. Since Earth was an independent planet in the Kingdom's territory, the Alexandrians weren't obliged to help them at all. That's why when the Alexander Kingdom scouting crew arrived at the planet in the beginning, they informed them that if they swore eternal loyalty to the royal family, they would be protected from those who harbor ill intentions to their planet. But Earthlings chose the third choice, putting their protection in the hands of the Alliance. Too bad, the Alliance's protection was based on rules and rules always had loopholes that could be taken advantage of. Only after the indirect and civilized invasion of the six organizations did Earthlings realize this fact. However, the kingdom didn't leave them hopeless as it provided them with another chance to come under their wing. At that time the council didn't reject the proposal again. However, since Earth was a member of the Alliance, the council couldn't just snap their fingers and they would leave it. It didn't work that way. There were only two ways to leave the Supremacy Games Alliance. First one, having five losses in a row result in immediate expulsion. The second one, getting kicked out of the ranking ladder after the two years rank update. In each update, the last 100 members in the ranking ladder of PSG get eliminated from the games, which kick them out from the alliance once and for all. It was called Supremacy Games Alliance for a reason. If a member in the SG alliance weren't useful like the wormhole race, the metal race, the witch race, the dwarf race, etc., they would be required to continuously participate in the games so they SG Alliance would earn profit from the viewers.i.p.s. If they couldn't do so, they could at least win enough games to avoid being part of the last 100 members on the ladder. Obviously, the last 100 members were always either newcomers planets like Earth who couldn't win enough games in two years or destroyed planets, kingdoms, and even empires due to wars. Just like this, the Alliance was getting rid of useless leeches every year from its behemoth body. This process of elimination was required since the Alliance was always getting new members like Earth. For Earth to accept getting under the kingdom's wing, they were requested by the Alexandrians to lose five games in a row since it was the fastest method than waiting for the rank update. 
the council didn't hesitate to order the team to do so. While the team was getting their asses hooped intentionally, only a few citizens complained about it since the council had shared their reason and everyone just wished for the chaos to end. Now, the chaos was raging for about a year or so. No one cared any more about the games, the pride and making the Earth's name resound wide in the PSG platform. The pictures of the first Earthling team were thrown in the garbage with the citizens' hearts who wanted to keep their independence and raise as a planet. Now? They just wanted peace and to go out in the cities without worrying about getting gunned down. The kingdom provided that peace, protection and safety which the council had failed to deliver. Felix still remembered the cheers vividly resounding in midtown Boston after the kingdom had streamed their hundreds of space.i.p.s fleets arriving on the planet and taking care of those six tumors. Currently, Felix was spectating this exact memory of him watching the kingdom's stream. After asking Asna to speed up for a bit, the fleet responsible for taking care of the Gamma organization had finally managed to pull them out from their hiding spot. It wasn't really that difficult since while Gamma wasn't able to rely on their surveillance resources, the kingdom had full permission to do so because Earth was officially part of their kingdom. After the Gamma organization was found out, there was no point in maintaining their camouflage. Thus, the disc-like spaceship was revealed in its glory to Felix. Unlike the grey uniformed spaceship.i.p.s surrounding it, the Gamma's spaceship was completely pitch black appearing like a creature instead of a spaceship made of alloys. Honestly, that shouldn't be a far-fetched analogy as that pitch-black material was from the dead skin of a void creature called, the symbiote. This void creature wasn't a race or an intelligent life form like the rest. Heck, it had only one single desire since its birth to death, gluttony. The symbiotes were born just like a parasite or a leech that needed a host to be active. However, Unlike parasites that needed the host to be alive, the symbiotes devour their host until not a single particle was left. After devouring it, they grew bigger in size allowing them to take over bigger hosts than them. The most frightful thing about them was the fact that hosts didn't actually need to be life forms. They could be rocks, alloys, or even an active star. Anything and everything could be consumed and will be consumed. Since gluttony was their only desire, they live to serve it fully by eating anything that came up in their path. Find authorized novels in Faster Updates, Better Experience. Please click number underscore 52098209488622633 for visiting. Due to this, some unfortunate civilized planets had met their doom after getting in the way of passing Symbiote who was bigger than their planet. If they were technologically advanced, they could make a great escape in time before the devour sequence began. But in the case of planets like Earth? It was truly the apocalypse. They couldn't even kill it or ask for help from other stronger civilizations to do it for them as it was known knowledge that nothing could kill a symbiote but itself. That's right. They were unkillable by any method used on them. It was already tested millions of times and the results were in the UVR for all to see. However, since the universe accepts nothing but balance in its body, those symbiotes couldn't just eat and grow to infinity. Instead, after reaching a certain size, their skin would be having difficulties containing the consumed energy. After all, the symbiotes never released even a single particle of the energy that was devoured. It wouldn't be possible to grow even more and since gluttony was their only desire, they couldn't stop even if they wanted, thus, boom. They could only explode akin to supernova releasing all of the energy they devoured throughout their entire lives. The only survivor from this explosion was bits and pieces of their pitch black skin, getting hurled in every direction and spreading throughout the cosmos. If it wasn't for the metal race's research spirit, that would never die down unless they discover the truth of the universe, those pieces of skin would have been utterly useless. However, in their magical hands, those pieces of skin have been revived yet again and connected, creating an artificial symbiote. The only difference between the real ones and the metal race created version was the mind. While a single desire controlled symbiotes, the artificial ones had an AI as their controlling brain. This meant those symbiotes gluttonous nature which was their bane was wholly uprooted. This turned them into a pacified controllable creatures that could be of great assistance. 
Alas, since they were made from dead skin, they weren't really as good as the real thing when it comes to devouring matter or absorbing energy. Heck, they weren't even 2% as good as the universe's creation. This downplayed their potential to the minimum in the eyes of the metal race. Hence, just like always, they sold the technology to anyone interested in buying it after playing enough with it. Unlike the metal race with inspiring goals, races like humans took advantage of the technology and discovered ways to utilize the artificial symbiotes. The first one was using it to coat the outside and inside of vehicles. They realized that it could add an extra layer of defense as it could absorb laser and plasma attacks. That wasn't all as the energy absorbed could be used effectively by the vehicle. This wasn't just applicable to vehicles but even life form hosts. The moment this discovery was uncovered, everyone wanted to own their artificial symbiote. Who could blame them? They could be used to coat everything even themselves. Since they were artificial, they could be controlled just by the queen. The possibilities were limitless. Alas, dead skin was required to create them, and the real symbiotes weren't really exploding all the time. This led to having a new market that was packed with customers but not enough goods to satisfy everyone. Naturally, this translated into having the prices of symbiotes dead skin rise through the roof. Heck, it got so bad some individuals started searching for dead skin like they were searching for gold nuggets. They actually did manage to find some since those dead skins were unkillable. They could be destroyed but they would be able always to recover again. If they were near each other they would attach back together. Meanwhile, some even decided to buy tiny pieces of artificial symbiotes and cultivate them like farms, feeding them with trash and waste to grow bigger and be sold for profit. Although the absorption rate was just 2% from the real symbiotes, it was still good enough for a small piece to grow as big as the Gamma's spaceship. That's how they probably got their own artificial symbiote that was currently blocking most of the laser and plasma attacks aiming at them from the kingdom's fleet in the stream. The more Felix watched, the more his desire grew for the artificial symbiote of the Gamma organization. Even though his 11th generation AP bracelet was created by an artificial symbiote, it couldn't devour and grow since it was locked into an AP bracelet. The moment an artificial symbiote gets locked, they would always devour to reach that state but never overeat to surpass it and grow bigger. That's because the moment a symbiote got bigger than one desired, it was impossible to shrink it back again unless they were willing to destroy some of it. That wasn't an easy endeavor. Felix knew that it would be impossible for him to grow his own symbiote to be as big as the Gamma's spaceship. It was an expensive and time-consuming job that might take years and years of never-ending work until it finally reached the state Felix wanted to be it. If it was so easy to achieve it, the Alexander Kingdom would have coded all of their fleet and space sh.i.p.s instead of being selective in their choices. Like coding the chief of the scouting crew Killis spaceship that visited Earth a year and a half before. Felix knew that he had only one opportunity to get his own massive artificial symbiote from the Gamma organization. Keep it safe for me as I will be retrieving it for my spaceship soon. He grinned widely as he carried on watching the Gamma's spaceship getting forced into retreating from the fleet's salvo. Chapter 307, Using the Third Wish Although the Gamma's spaceship was protected from those attacks, the organization didn't dare to trade fire with the fleet. They knew who to bully and who to fear. The kingdom wasn't to be trifled with like earthlings. Thus, they retreated without shooting a single beam at the fleet. The fleet also didn't chase them as they had no enmity with the organization. Heck, Felix knew that criminal organizations like Gamma were doing the kingdom a great favor by forcing newly discovered planets into ditching their independence and getting under their wing. So it was a win-win for both the kingdom and the criminal organizations. Sometimes Felix wonders whether the kingdom was the one sending the Gamma organization at them to force them into joining their kingdom. After all, the Gamma organization had reached the planet a year ago while the planet's coordination had been released at that time not even for half a year. It was a bit too soon for Earth to be found out unless they were pretty unlucky. So there was always this sense of doubt and conspiracy about the whole matter. Fifteen minutes later. 
Felix had left the consciousness space after replaying the memory more than ten times until he finally managed to match the shape of Gamma's spaceship with its module. It took him a while simply due to the symbiote coding all of it. However, he figured out only the spaceship module and not which generation it belonged to or the alloy grade was used underneath the symbiote skin. Felix only wanted to know the alloy grade since his plan's success was heavily dependent on it. Felix even searched in the UVR for pictures or recordings about the Gamma's spaceship. Alas, the symbiote was always there to cover it. Screw it. I will do an elimination process. Felix closed the many holograms before him and left only one showing a list of the known alloys grades used mostly in space.i.p.s. Well, at least the ones making it to the Milky Way galaxy. First, Felix eliminated the topmost alloys, which were too expensive for the Gamma organization. He then removed the lower graded ones, which were affordable for the majority. This left him with only four grades, which could be considered the mainstream alloys used by the majority of planets, kingdoms, and empires in the galaxy. He then removed one more alloy that was currently monopolized by the neighbor empire known for its massive armies and space fleets. This alloy was banned from being used by any other human empire or kingdom. This meant it was challenging for it to land in the black market and the Gamma organization to obtain it. This left Felix with only three more alloys. However, he didn't know which to eliminate next since they were available in both markets. Whatever, let's pick Nanum Alloy. It has the highest defenses of them all. Felix removed the other two and left a dark bronze-colored alloy in the list. Felix pressed on it, and its details were displayed. Slash slash. Grade, B. Alloy name. N991A1N2A33M98 Defense, AA+. Hardness, Earthlings Vickers Measurement 9100 Density, 90800 kg-m3-slash The alloy's grade might be just B since its high density or weight was pulling it down, but it covered it up with its astonishing hardness. Compared to hard steel that had only 900 hardness on the Vickers scale, the nanum alloy had nine times that result. This meant it was ten times harder than steel. This results in getting graded AA and for its defenses, as with that hardness, it would be quite difficult for laser beams and plasma to penetrate it that easily. The downside of this alloy was its terrifying weight that reached almost 91 kilograms for a one meter cubic, find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number, Underscore five two one four one one seven four nine 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 two seven two four two four for visiting. A spaceship made completely with this alloy would definitely struggle with energy and speed as its consumption would be monstrous compared to the rest. But at least the defenses were all right. Felix didn't really know if the Gamma's spaceship was made of nanum alloy or another. But, he would base his plan around it so he wouldn't be screwed over later on. Felix had only one opportunity to take care of the Gamma organization and he was going to take full advantage of it. Queen, does my third wish allow me to get a custom-made dark deviant spaceship? Felix abruptly asked. Yes. The Queen paused, but there will be a limitation to the modification that you are planning to make. Felix nodded his head in understanding and requested, can you make a list of the available Mega Red Plasma weapons that I could use? Is that your wish? The Queen asked, scaring the shit of Felix. Hell no. He denied it firmly, that's just a request. Then, my apologies sir. Felix but I can't fulfill your request since some of the weapons are restricted information that needed higher access than you possess. She clarified. I see. Felix smiled wryly after realizing what she meant. Although Felix's wish was to get him the restricted weapon that he desired he couldn't just ask the Queen to show all of the available ones since there were probably thousands of them. Some of them weren't really public information that the Queen could share with Felix without a problem. Unless he wished upon it or had access to that information, he could forget about seeing them. Alright, show me only the weapons that are currently public information, and please add their market prices. 
Felix rephrased his request and the Queen this time had no issues by creating a holographic list that was displaying those weapons. SSSSSS. Felix couldn't help inhale loudly at the sight of the staggering prices, reaching a minimum of 200 million SC per weapon. But what did he expect when he was asking for red plasma weapons for space sh.i.p.s? Those weapons were only below pure white plasma weapons in destructiveness and penetration. One shot from those weapons was enough to obliterate Felix's Sky Peel Island into dust. Good shit. After his shock withdrew back Felix started laughing in pure delight while scrolling down the list. The further down he went, the higher the prices got and the size of the weapon increased. At the start, they were small enough to be placed at the sides of a spaceship akin to cannons. But after he reached the bottom, the weapons were the bulk of the F** King spaceship. Some of them were dreadful enough it caused shivers to course in Felix's spine. Yet after reading that each of them cost at least 20 billion SC, Felix begrudgingly scrolled up again and settled with the ones at the middle of the pack that cost from 400 million to 1 billion. Soon, he started clicking each one and reading its details. Some weapons were capable of firing multiple shots and some could only fire one shot. Few had low plasma energy consumption while the rest were devouring it in each shot. Yet, Felix didn't focus much on those details but the destructiveness of those weapons against Nanum Alloy and the artificial symbiote. Felix never had intentions of battling the Gamma organization hand to hand when hiding inside their spaceship. It was impossible to sneak inside without being found since he knew that the symbiote skin was coating even inside the ship. This meant, the moment his feet stepped on it, the AI would recognize that he was an outsider. Even if Felix by some chance managed to end inside of it, how was he supposed to fight it out with the Gamma organization members when they were all at minimum peak second stage bloodliners? Heck, Mr. Gamma was infamous for being a peak third stage bloodliner. That's just the strength of the bloodliners inside, not mentioning the weapons that would be aimed at him from every direction. Felix had absolutely no chance of victory against them unless he caught up in integration and he met them outside of their spaceship. Even hiring peak fourth stage bloodliners to do the deed for him wasn't going to work out. Thus, Felix never planned on playing fair but as dirty as possible. What's dirtier than sneakily obtaining their spaceship's coordination right under their noses using it for delivering a destructive red plasma beam from high above? So while Mr. Gamma and the rest were preparing to start early chaos on the planet, Felix was planning to turn them into dust. This plan would have never worked if the organization realized that Felix had obtained their space coordination. They would have changed their position and his plan was doomed to fail. Hence, his immense hard work makes Mr. 12 suspect nothing about him. However, for Felix's upcoming spaceship to one-shot them, the red plasma weapon needed to break into both the artificial symbiote and the nanum alloy's hardness at the same time without losing most of its power. Thus, Felix had to make simulations with each weapon to find out. In the simulations, he created the Gamma's spaceship and fired at them with the weapons from every direction. As expected, some weapons managed to bypass the artificial symbiote defenses and stop at the nanum alloy while some managed to penetrate both of them, but, they lost all of their powers causing almost no damage to the spaceship. After spending hours on those simulations using one weapon after the other, Felix finally found his Sword of Judgment. It wasn't far-fetched to call it a sword as its design was thin and quite long. The mouth of the weapon was at the very tip of it. It might look small on the screen but Felix knew that a beam from that mouth was big enough to be seen from hundreds of miles. This weapon's test results were auspicious as a one-shot by destroying 90% of the ship and anyone inside of it. To make sure, Felix ran the tests ten more times and the result was still the same. It was impossible to survive this attack. The only drawbacks from this one were the massive plasma energy consumption, heating up after only one shot making it impossible to fire another until it cooled down. Lastly, there was a half an hour channeling period. Adding to all of this, its price was 600 million SC. Yet, Felix didn't even falter when he requested, Queen, I wish to have a dark Diviat spaceship with its main weapon being XR Divine Judgment. Are you certain? 
the queen asked for a confirmation. Yes. Felix said, smirking. T.I. Ring. Chapter 308, The Hilton's Dynasty Had Crumbled. Your wish has been granted. You can expect the modified spaceship and its license to reach you in five months, number S Dynasty had crumbled, underscore 521544432270021592159 for visiting. Felix knew that if he wished for the deviant spaceship alone it would reach him in a minimum of 15 days. After all, it wasn't really that expensive or rare. Its current market price was merely 185 million SC. If it wasn't for the licensing that needed months to years to be approved for individuals like Felix, he would have purchased a better one. The reason it took months was due to the vetting process done on the owner. After all, Spaceship.i.p.s couldn't be sold to just anyone. Otherwise, any pirate could start changing between Spaceship.i.p.s whenever he got bored or the one he was using got destroyed. Thus, if Felix went and ordered one, he would be thoroughly examined in all of his past criminal activities. Although he had none, the process would still take ages since there were many requests to buy Spaceship.i.p.s. Obviously, this was just for individuals, groups, families, etc. As for planets and such, they could straight away purchase them for their armies and fleet. But, they would be bound by contract to not sell them to individuals without vetting them first. All of this was done to reduce the piracy rates in the universe. Plus, licensed SHI.P.S with their original owners would be capable of landing on any civilized planet. Of course, they could be denied entry but the license made sure that they reached the planet. As for those without it, they wouldn't even dare step near those planets since they would be considered pirates. Thankfully, with Felix using the wish for the spaceship, he crossed all of those long procedures since the Queen had deemed him clean based on his data. Queen, I want my spaceship to be parked on the dark side of the moon. Felix stood up from the bed and said, make sure that it was camouflaged properly. Felix had no intentions of riding his spaceship during the assault when he could control it remotely from his bed. Plus, it was safer this way since the Deviant Spaceship's alloy wasn't known for its hardness or defenses. This meant, if the Gamma organization wasn't taken care of properly, they might strike his spaceship back and ruin it easily. Felix chose the Dark Deviant just because of its excellent anti-surveillance system. Since Felix wanted to launch a single strike, his ambush needed to be implacable. Plus, he needed to be on the ground to collect his loot as fast as possible after the strike. Otherwise, the US government would rush there faster than him and take the artificial symbiote and the rest of the loot. For the Gamma organization who were trading resources for bloodliners, it was obvious that their spaceship would be packed with them. Well, if they did manage to survive the plasma beam in the first place. Two days went by in a jiffy. Olivia, Noah, Kenny and the rest of the U.S. team had already arrived at the drop yesterday. Naturally, they were informed of everything that happened during their sleep. Even Adam's betrayal. The only one who felt absolutely nothing from it was Noah. He was only pissed that he got poisoned for 24 hours making his little sister worry for him. As for the rest? Each took it differently. However, all of them recovered easily from the trauma since Adam wasn't related to any of them. They only spent at best three months with each other. So, they didn't bother with the matter anymore and mingled with the rest of the Earthling team. Speaking about the team, those two days were really well needed since everyone had gotten a lot closer to each other than the first time they met. Heck, Olivia had already made friends with most of the team members. Well, it was to be expected as her bubbly and kind personality was tough to hate. Meanwhile, the Hilton's fate ended up being even worse than what was anticipated as the authorities had found them guilty after the thorough investigation carried out during the Hilton's sleep. So when they woke up, they weren't greeted with looks of relief as the rest but handcuffs tightened with their hand in the bed. To make it worse, three police officers were placed in their room watching over them and their AP bracelets were removed. Before the shock of the sight could even set in, they were taken roughly for a rapid trial that didn't last even an hour. 
In that hour, the Hilton elders and Adam had their hearts chilled at the evidence collected. Some were related to the kidnapping attempts and the majority were related to their grey schemes used for their assets. Nineteen hours to twenty were more than enough for the security agencies to dig up dirt from the Hilton's business empire when they had the full support of the council and the public. Not to mention those who could stop them were all asleep at the time. Hence, the trial went smoothly for everyone but the Hiltons. After it ended, the final verdict was for the Grand Elder's execution for being the mastermind of the kidnapping attempt at the captain of the Earthling team. The rest of the Elders and Adam were ruled to serve life without parole and prison. This meant they wouldn't be able to leave the prison even if they behaved properly. Too bad, before the Elders and Adam could sign in relief at keeping their lives, Joseph and two more Elders got sniped right in the forehead the moment they stepped outside of the courtroom. The Bounty's hunters had made their move and it terrified Adam and the rest of the Elders. They knew that the Gamma organization had kept its word by placing bounties on their heads. This made them feel like they were walking dead men since the prisoners wouldn't hesitate to shiv them when their foot stepped in prison. Execution or not. None of them would live long except for Adam who would be placed in a special cell made from the exact white material used in the arenas. Even with his strength, he wouldn't be able to damage it. As for his abilities... They were already extracted making him feel like he was just an empty husk. Meanwhile, their assets were split apart by the government and the Maxwell family since Felix was affected the most by this kidnapping attempt. So it appeared like it was compensation for the damages caused. But that was just a bullshit excuse so the other families wouldn't raise a ruckus at how biased the country was in its treatment of the Maxwells. Just like that. The Hilton's dynasty was brought to the ground by a single decision, kidnapping Felix. Adam and the rest of the elders had all the time in their lives to regret this decision in their tiny cells. At that time, Felix had watched the trial and the assassinations while munching on a poisoned flavored sandwich in his bedroom. He didn't even lift a finger and the Hiltons were already taken care of properly. While Adam was rotting in a cell now, Felix had already earned everyone's respect and approval as the captain after he demolished anyone who sought to spar with him. He didn't just win over them but also showed them their mistakes and taught them ways to utilize their strength more effectively. Felix didn't mind teaching them as the better they got the more chances he would have to relax in the PSG. He had no intentions to carry them every game. Right now, most team members were sitting on the stands of a medium-sized arena while watching Zhang Wei and Leo Bridge duke it out for the 40th round in the past two days. Looking at Zhang Wei's numbed expression as he blocked Leo's brownish fists, everyone started sympathizing with the gentle giant. When Leo got destroyed by Felix easily, he switched targets to Harris for spars. In the end, he landed on the gentle and shy Zhang Wei who was too kind to say no and reject that battle maniac's spar requests. Now it had been already two hours since they started and every time a spar ends, Leo would bully Zhang Wei to start another even though he was losing most of the time. If it wasn't for his energy consumption no one doubted that he would battle 24 sevenths. Australians are truly scary. Olivia commentated softly while sitting next to an aqua blue-haired doll-like girl who shared the same short height as her. However, the girl didn't respond to her as she was occupied by reading the news on a hologram. Hina Olivia tilted her head and peeked at Hina Suzuki's hologram. Seeing that it was a news anchor reporting in Japanese with a solemn expression, she couldn't help but ask in intrigue, what is he reporting about? He is saying that in the past two days there was a noticeable spike in missing people reports and kidnapping attempts happening in broad daylight. Hina replied, very serious. It's that bad. Sophia who was sitting right behind them interjected in their conversation with her eyes focused on the hologram. She was looking at the kidnapping graph that had climbed explosively in the past two days. Hina shook her head and said solemnly, it's even worse. As the ones kidnapped were mostly bloodliners. The girls were stunned at hearing her say so. They didn't think that bloodliners would be getting kidnapped right after the attempt on Felix. They expected that the world would get safer after seeing how heavy-handed the council had dealt with the Hiltons, but it seemed like they merely wished for the impossible. Chapter 309, 
the Gama organization revealing itself. Is it only in Japan? Sophia wondered in doubt after checking Germany's news and seeing that no one was reporting the same. Let me see mine, Olivia said while opening CNN in her hologram. The moment she increased the volume, the news anchor's tensed voice resounded in the area, in New York, ten civilians had died during an active shooting between a gang and a fire elementalist who was serving as a fireman in duty. While in Phoenix, Two police officers had been gunned down by three masked individuals after trying to protect their colleague who was a bloodliner in lesser purity. In the state of California, the news anchor kept mentioning a piece of news before jumping into another state to report the grim news in it. It was never ending. There were tragic news like these everywhere and the result was either kidnapping the bloodliner successfully or gunning them down. The more the girls heard the paler their expression got. This dreadful news gave them the feeling like the U.S. citizen had turned against the bloodliners. Before long, everyone noticed the girls' peculiar expressions and the news they were watching. After understanding what was going on, their reaction was more or less the same as the girls. Why is everyone targeting bloodliners? Johnson asked what was on everyone's mind. Alas, no one seemed to know the answer as even the reporters were wondering the same. Soon. Everyone started looking at their country's news with worried expressions. Just like the U.S., those kinds of assaults at the bloodliners had occurred and were still occurring. The only difference was that the U.S. clearly had more cases than other countries. Just as they were planning on calling their families, instructors, and even Mr. Rodriguez to understand what's going on, their bracelets rang at the same time again. It's from Mr. Rodriguez. Upon seeing so, Sophia displayed the message on a hologram so they could read it together. They thought it would be addressing the grim situation outside of the island but it was just mentioning that everyone should group in the meeting room at 9 a.m. Johnson glanced at his bracelet while standing up from his seat. Let's go. We only have ten minutes. Everyone exited the arena after informing Zhang Wei and Leo about the message content. As for Felix and Sylvia who weren't grouped up with them? They didn't bother to inform them since they received the same message. Two minutes later, everyone had reached a spherical building that resembled a white egg. They were riding on the black platforms, appearing like a mob of motorcycles with their numbers and uniformed outfits. After they jumped from the platforms, they got scanned again in front of the entrance before entering the building. This was the team's meeting room and only a few staff members were allowed entry since the discussed matters inside were mostly classified. They had already entered once during their exploration, so they didn't react much when they saw the buildings inside that resembled a congress room. But they were surprised by seeing Felix and Sylvia sitting next to each other in front seats while conversing softly. Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number. Underscore five two one five eight one five three two seven three four three eight two nine three for visiting. While it appeared to some like they were flirting, in reality they were merely discussing the assaults against the bloodliners. After hearing their footsteps, both stopped speaking at once and looked at their teammates finding their own seats to take. To avoid confusion and problems, the seats were marked with numbers corresponding to their team's rank. So it wasn't really that weird for Felix and Sylvia to be seating next to each other. After a couple of minutes, the chatter in the Congress-like room died down as Mr. Roger Gass had entered with two men and one woman from the back door. Oh. George has been chosen as one of the instructors for the team. Felix mused with a faint smile after seeing the youthful and charming George standing upright behind Mr. Roger Gass. Just as he assumed, Mr. Roger Gass didn't waste time with needless chatter as he swiftly started introducing each of those three individuals straight after his greeting. George Garcia, the previous U.S. national instructor had been elected as the main instructor of the Earthlings team due to his team's suburb performance in the world's competition. Mr. Roger Gass then extended his hand to a tall mature woman who had a mole on her left cheek and was wearing glasses. Sasha Bacharov the previous Russian team instructor had been elected as an instructor assistant who would mostly be training the reserve team. After introducing those two, Mr. Roger Gass gestured with his hand for a youthful man without a single facial hair on his face or body. 
No hair, no eyebrows, nothing. He appeared like a tanned egg. Mr. Rodriguez placed his hand on the man's shoulder and said with a pleased smile, This is the vice-captain of the Brazilian team, Ronaldinho Castro. He won the 1v1 tournament that was hosted in my UVR room. Thus, he had earned his place in the Earthling team and would be considered as the new number 100. Clap clap clap. Only after the introduction was concluded did everyone applaud the new additions to the team. While Mr. Rodriguez was clearly happy about Ronaldinho making it in the team since he was a Brazilian as well, Olivia and the rest of the US team were CK to see George as their team instructor. Even Felix was glad that George was chosen. After the applause died down, those three went to sit in their designated seats leaving the stage for Mr. Rodriguez. His expression instantly hardened removing any signs of joy from before. Seeing that he was getting serious, everyone knew what was about to come. I have received your inquiries about the mess happening currently in most countries. We have known since yesterday the source or the cause of it. Mr. Rodriguez paused and spoke with a tingle of worry, I am afraid that we have been targeted by an infamous non-native criminal organization that refers to itself as Gama. While some juniors were gasping in shock and fear, most of them had absolutely no idea what it meant to be targeted by a criminal organization. Mr. Rodriguez didn't hesitate to share with them some of the information obtained about the Gama organization. Only after hearing that kidnapped bloodliners were having their abilities extracted to be sold did the juniors realize the situation's seriousness and dreadfulness. Yet, the worst had to come as Mr. Rodriguez created a hologram and showed everyone the announcement that had gone viral between the Dark Forces circles. The announcement was short and simple. It had a long list of items plus the prices. Above it. There was an introduction of the Gama organization and its previous operations so no one would doubt their claims. To make it even more believable, the announcement had a couple of links that would transfer the clicker to the organization's own website in both Dark Web and UVR Dark Network. Inside the website, there were thousands of videos and recordings showing two censored parties trading between each other. The trade happening would make anyone feel sick in his stomach as tied up unmoving bodies were being traded for potions, weapons, bloodline bottles and other impossible to get resources for commoners. After Mr. Rodriguez showed a couple of videos ruining everyone's appetite of the day, he scrolled back to the list and pointed at Felix's name that was at the very top of it. By now, you should realize that the Hiltons had truly attempted to kidnap Felix but not because of some bullshit feud but it was to sell him to the Gama organization. Mr. Rodriguez exhaled in relief, thankfully, an anonymous bloodliner saved him. However, the organization was clearly unpleased by the Hiltons' failure so they threw them to the sharks and placed this bounty on Captain Felix's head to make his stay in the island unpleasant. His threatening look as he said so made it pretty obvious for those juniors what he was implying. No one should harbor any thoughts about Felix no matter how much their greed kept pushing them. It would push them all right as the bounty reward was tier 1 legendary bloodline that could be sold in auctions for at least 100 million SC. So Felix was a walking cash grab on the island. Yet, Felix didn't seem bothered by it as he merely kept that natural smile affixed on his face while glancing at everyone's tensed expressions. Feeling that the atmosphere was getting uncomfortable, Sylvia asked calmly, Sir, what can we do to help? Nothing. Mr. Rodriguez closed the announcement and said sternly, I showed you this information since I wanted to keep you updated. You should know that anything spoken in the room should remain within it. But. No buts. Mr. Rodriguez knitted his eyebrows and said, This is the council's situation to solve not yours. You guys have your own battles to fight for, and from today onwards you will start training to win them all. After hearing so, no one dared to retort any more as Mr. Rodriguez was completely right. Their fights were in the upcoming games, as for anything that happened outside of the island? That was the responsibility of others. Seeing that everyone was focused again, Mr. Rodriguez clapped his hands twice and said, We don't have time to waste, so let's begin the signing ceremony. Chapter 310, This is the Supremacy Games Alliance. Three holograms abruptly manifested before everyone. 
All of them were contracts. If it wasn't for this many contracts that needed to be signed at once, it wouldn't have been called a signing ceremony. Read them carefully before signing. Mr. Rodriguez sat next to the podium while saying one last time, If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Felix started by reading the contract on the left side that was titled as Loyalty Contract. This contract was concerning every team member as it had terms related to be loyal to the team and not betray them inside the games. The terms were quite standard without anything unfamiliar. The only questionable term would be the penalty for breaking the contract. Instead of making the Queen execute the traitors, she simply informs the Council and they would take it from there. After reading this term, Felix couldn't help but reflexively gaze at Kenny who always had a warm smile on his face. Whatever, time will tell. Felix shrugged his shoulder slightly and carried on reading the first contract. After seeing that it was loophole-free, he signed and moved to the second contract that was tilted, Earthling Team. Felix knew that the moment he signed this contract his life would be tied with PSG just like when he signed the Individual Supremacy Games contract. Plus, unlike in the ISG where he could use an anonymous character, in the planetary games that wasn't allowed. This meant, his name, age, address, position in the team, and the rest of the information would be all accessible on the platform. Of course, besides extremely private information like his affinity rating, integration level, and such. Felix didn't mind showing his name and the rest as he had no plans to hide even in the planetary games. He knew that with his poison manipulation, he could keep deceiving everyone easily by simply using six sets of poison abilities each time he replaced his bloodline. So, he had absolutely nothing to fear from having his abnormality found out. After he signed it, Felix went to the last contract that was tilted captain's duties. This contract was concerning only Felix. Since he was the captain of the team this meant he would be the one rolling the format and game's wheel. In addition, he would be the one making a wish in case they won a game. Naturally, the ESG organization couldn't give all of this authority to Felix. The contract simply states that Felix was required permission to roll the wheels, use game coupons, and the wish. Felix signed it too since he knew about this all along and he didn't have any problem with it. The wish belongs to the planet not his, and the council should be the one deciding on it. Here where the extra votes gotten from the representative spots would shine as the decisions between country leaders would differ and the one with the highest vote would be taken. However, Felix wasn't stripped from all relations to a wish as he was given one vote that belonged to the team. He could use it in the council as well. He could even attend the council and propose a wish or deny it. After Felix signed it, he leaned on his seat and started surveying the rest who were reading the terms of the contracts carefully. Some were asking questions and some had their heads buried in the contracts. No one seemed to hesitate or having second thoughts after seeing that death in the games was real. They all knew what they were going to sign for before even participating in the national tournaments. Thus, everyone had signed after merely one hour. Now, the team had truly been registered in the games. Seeing that they finished, Mr. Rodriguez smiled faintly and returned to the podium. Now that the team had been registered on the platform, we can finally make the first wheel spin. Clap clap. The atmosphere got lively at the sound of the heavy applause and whistles as everyone was too eager to see what's the first planetary game they would be placed at. Everyone already read all of the planetary game's rules back to back. Therefore, they knew that unlike individual games which had two months reset between games and five days preparation after rolling the wheel, the planetary games system was completely different. First, the teams weren't given even a day to reset. They could potentially roll a wheel, play the game and roll the wheel tomorrow again. However, they were given a month of preparation after rolling the wheel. So although they didn't have any reset to bother with, they were still going to wait for a month whether they liked it or not if the other contestants decided to practice for the entire month instead of just playing immediately after rolling the game. In the case of Earthlings, they were already given two years of preparation before their first ever game. Now, they were left with only four months before the period finishes. 
By Felix rolling the wheel now, they would have four months to practice thoroughly. But after it, they would be given just one month of preparation just like the others. With that being said, the competitive and veteran teams rarely bother to use an entire month to prepare as they already had a hefty amount of experience in the games. Thus, the moment they notice that it was a game they played before, they voice their readiness to the Queen. Those rules were placed like this since there weren't really that many members in the Alliance to create a problem for the platform. After all, PSG wasn't like ISG where anyone with some strength could barge in the SG administration office and sign a contract. So there wasn't a point to force the Alliance members into waiting a month or two before rolling the wheel again and then give them another month for preparation. If it was like this, no one would be climbing the ladder of the SG Alliance efficiently as it was a long long one. That's why it was being branched out in each race. A simple analogy would be considering the SG Alliance as a fir tree. Start thick at the bottom and keeps getting thinner and thinner until it reaches the top. The peak of the tree would be the ruling power of the SG Alliance. This peak was dominated by strong races born and built for wars and fights unlike the peaceful metal race. Though the metal race, witch race, space worm race, hive race, dwarf race and some other races were also part of this ruling power since their contribution to the SG Alliance was unfathomable. Meanwhile, the branches of the tree were taken by other weaker races. Weaker in a sense that either their strength wasn't enough to fight those at the top, or their contribution wasn't good enough. The human race as a whole had a tiny branch gotten due to their contribution and improvement done to the UVR and the SG Alliance. After all, their devilish monetization plans in the UVR had allowed the SG Alliance to profit heavily from the commoners. Having a tiny branch was great on its own since only by owning one could an Scallion's member actually be part of the inner circle. They could have small power in it as well as profit. Then we have the STEM. This was the battlefield that included all competitors wanting to climb up and secure a branch of their own. Everyone on the STEM was considered an outer circle member. They could neither affect the SG Alliance nor profit from their operations. In it, empires, kingdoms, federations, small alliances, and many more strong competitors from all corners of the universe battle in the games for two reasons. Obtain the first branch for their race, making them part of the inner circle in the SG Alliance. If their race was already a member of the inner circle, them getting another branch would be making their race have more power in the Alliance. For example, if the Alexander Kingdom, Karania Kingdom, Mariana Empire all passed through the stem and had gotten a branch of their own, those branches would combine with the tiny human race's branch and make it bigger. Bigger translates to more power and profit for the human race in general. If the branch kept getting bigger and longer, it wouldn't be long before it reaches the top and joins the ruling power of the SG Alliance. That's why the stem was called the main battlefield of the SG Alliance. Since it was called as such, it only implied that there were other battlefields. Those battlefields were occurring underground on the roots of the tree. Those roots each were being owned by a race. They held the newcomers in the SG Alliance. Just like the roots of the tree weren't being seen or beautified like the tree, the members of this rank had absolutely no presence in the SG Alliance. Hundreds of them could disappear at once and no one would give a shit about them. Though, they would care about the phenomena that caused it. Naturally, the Earthling team was at bottom of the human race's root. Heck, they could be considered as being a hundred meters underground. The only way for them to climb up was to compete against Scallion's members on the same route. Obviously, they would be humans as well from all different corners of the Milky Way galaxy. Just like that, even the weakest member of the SG Alliance had a clear path set before him to reach the supremacy. It all depends on its team effort in the games. This was the Supremacy Games Alliance. A behemoth that gave a chance of survival to even the fleas on its body. There is more to be explained about the SG Alliance format. This was just a simple analogy to make it less confusing. Midgard. 311 Spinning the First Earthling's Wheel. Captain Felix, can you do the honor of spinning the wheel on stage? Mr. Rodriguez asked politely while gesturing with his hand at the empty stage. 
Felix nodded his head and stepped forward. After standing on the stage and seeing everyone's hopeful gazes, he gave a sheepish smile and said, Fair warning, my luck can be tragic in those kinds of draws. Alas, no one believed in his claim as they merely scoffed in annoyance. It was already public knowledge that Felix had won his legendary bloodline in a UVR lottery which was almost impossible to be true. Yet, here he was shamelessly bragging that his luck was trash on draws. Had, they would be fools to believe him. Seeing their reaction, Felix shrugged his shoulders carelessly and manifested a hologram displaying the Earthling's new profile interface. Slash 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 picture, the planet's picture taken from outer space. Name, The Earthling Team Flag, Picture Titles, None Date of Creation, May 2, 2026 Address, 3rd Planet in 788G Solar System, 97th Stellar District, Alexander Kingdom, Mariana Empire Territory, in the Milky Way Galaxy Team Members List C. Felix Maxwell slash V. C. Sylvia Ivanov slash M. T. Olivia Maxwell slash M. T. Zhongwei slash M. T. slash Press on the name for more information. Average integration level, between origin purity and first stage lesser purity. Rank, unranked. Play four placement games to get ranked. About, empty. Games played, 0 0 0. Wins. 000. Loss, 000. Win streak, 000. Loss streak, 000. Eliminations, 000. Slash slash. The moment everyone saw the profile, they swiftly opened it with their own bracelets, wanting to check if they had the same one. Soon, hundred or so of holograms had manifested in the room, showing the same details. Naturally, the first thing they did was press on their name to check what was written about them. Seeing that it was just basic information without any dazzling achievement to brag about, they quickly closed them shut and focused back on Felix who clicked on Start a New Game at the bottom of the profile. After clicking it, he was transferred to the same hologram with only one green button in its center. Everyone held their breaths in anticipation and a hint of worry while staring at the green button. They didn't dare to blink just not to miss anything. Felix scratched his chin with one hand and used the other to push the big green button. Immediately after a humongous colorful wheel emerged and started to spin rapidly. Felix didn't leave it spin for even a second before he ordered out loud, Stop! Ting! 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 The needle kept bypassing a format after the other while gradually slowing down. Soon. The wheel was slowed to the point everyone was able to spot the format names. Just like individual games, there was battle, puzzles, sports, competitive lifestyle, tournaments, vehicles and the list goes on and on. Ting. Ting, ting. Congratulation on picking sports format. Upon hearing the loud notification accompanied by fireworks like they won the lottery, everyone reacted differently. Some were clearly excited about the format and some were showing signs of worry. Mr. Roger Gass was of the latter. His worry was understandable as sports format had an extensive range of games that require skill and practice above having combat capabilities. He wished for the battle format since most games in it were straightforward and for the Earthling team that was still lacking experience in working together, those games would be much easier than the rest. Hopefully, the sport chosen wouldn't require too much skill. Hopeful, Mr. Roger Gass murmured while looking at Felix press the second green button casually. Just like before, Felix stopped the wheel from spinning in its first seconds. Everyone's eyes kept watching one game after the other hit the needle and pass by. This kept going on and on until it was finally stopped on a green-colored game. Ting! Congratulation on picking elemental football game. Without Felix doing anything, a humongous side hologram emerged and displayed the game's details to everyone. Slash slash game format, sports. Game name, elemental football. Participants number, 1. The integration allowed, from lesser purity to peak stage 1 of replacement. Ranks allowed, 
Bronze. The game map, the Galactical Elemental Football Stadium. Surprise edition, no. Prizes pool, high grade stones, peak grade stones, beautifying flower, instant acceleration potion, XL handgun blueprint, G2 spatial card. Malala Hovercar Manufacture Blueprint Rules of the Game 1. Only 16 players are allowed from each team. 12 on the field slash 4 as substitutes. 2. Touching the ball with a hand results in a free kick. 3. Touching the ball with hands a second time after the first penalty given results in 5 minutes expulsion from the match. 4. Only the goalkeeper is allowed to touch the ball with his hands. 5. Battles unrelated to possession of the ball are punishable by the referee. 6. Yellow card for the first offense and 5 minutes expulsion from the match slash red card for the second offense and permanent expulsion. 7. If a player got permanently expelled or died in the match, the coach slash manager of the team could use a substitute to bring the numbers back up. 8. Goals could be scored by anything except for hands. Elemental abilities slash morphing abilities. 9. Healers from both teams would be placed at corners of the stadium protected by domes. Injured players could be transported inside the dome to be healed then sent back into the match. 10. Game points could be earned through goals and successful blocks. 11. The match would last 90 minutes. There are extra time and penalties in case of a draw. 12. Normal goals are worth 1 point slash stylish goals are worth 2 points. 13. The team with the most points will win the match. For more information please open your SG profile interface. Good luck to all participants slash slash. Yes. I have been playing football since I was a baby. Abruptly, the silent atmosphere was broken by Leo's vigorous shout. His excited expression and tightened fists were a clear indication that he was ready to kick some ass. She had no issues with chess, playing instruments, and even some winter sports like ice skating. But 710. Football? Nope. Hee <laughs> hee, me as well. Ronaldinho smirked while pointing at his shining bald head, I am especially good at headers. Alas, their enthusiasm and confidence weren't shared by most team members since it was either a long time since they touched a ball or never did. Unsurprisingly, Sylvia's expression and some girls in the team also hardened at the game chosen. Naturally, for Sylvia to be the daughter of Russia's president, she never touched a football in her life. She had no issues with chess, playing instruments, and even some winter sports like ice skating. But football? Nope. While Sylvia was dying inside, Olivia and Sophia were high-fiving in delight. It was due to Rule 8 which clearly stated that they would have a protected clinic to heal their teammates inside the match. So, they weren't required to play ball with the rest and they could still be useful. It seems like I need to work on my rusty feet. Felix mused to himself after reading that game points were based on goals. Although the game clearly stated that all abilities were allowed to score goals, Felix's poison abilities weren't really going to affect the ball. After all, it was obviously going to be indestructible and immune to all kinds of effects. This meant he needed to start practicing his kicking and heading. Heck, if his tail control was as good as Silver Hammer, Felix could totally use it in the match. Have you read all details? George abruptly stood up from his seat as he said, If you have, let's get going to the VR training room. Upon hearing that George was planning on starting the training right now, Mr. Rodriguez wished them good luck and left through the back door. If it wasn't for the Gamma organization and the increasing chaos outside of the Earthling team's headquarters, he would have stayed to watch their training. Alas, just like he said earlier, the team only had one job and that was winning the games. However, for him and the rest, they needed to carry the matters of the world on their shoulders. After he left, George turned around and saw that most of the main team's members were clearly crestfallen. Displeased, he knitted his eyebrows and said, What did you expect from the games? That you will be getting only what you are good at. Soft dejected mumbles resounded in the room at his questions. 
Although they already knew that there were thousands of different games on the platform, they still wished to luck out on something around their preferences. Some of them were good at basketball while some were good at riding mounts. Each had their own talents and hobbies they enjoyed playing besides training their combat skills. Since the platform had combat in every game without exception, they already had 70% of the requirement to participate in the games. However, that 30% would always not up to their hands. Just like now, Leo and Ronaldinho were clearly good at football and played it even after the SG invitation, unlike the rest. George crossed his hands above his chest and said strictly, it's impossible to excel in every game. That's just a matter of fact. However, you can always perform to the best of your abilities and assist the team in ways you didn't even know before. He looked at them in the eyes and suddenly turned his hand into a burning torch. He then created a holographic football and placed it one meter in front of him. Everyone was left confused by the sight. However, soon their eyes widened in shock after seeing George punch the holographic ball using a fist manifested from pure flames. Whoosh! Boom! George controlled the holographic ball to fly away with his flaming fist. Both of them smashed into the podium, forcing the dumbfounded Felix to jump out of the way. You might be trash at football. Heck, even I have played it only two times in my life. But, don't forget that we are not going to play earthling football. George said coolly while fixing his tie, we will be playing elemental football. Whoa. The room erupted in wild cheers after getting pumped up in the most unusual way possible. They didn't know who this George was but they f asterisking loved the balls he had to destroy property in the drop. Damn, I must have looked cool. Maybe, everyone will respect me as their instructor after this. Hearing those cheers, George couldn't help but display a faint smug smile. Alas, his smug smile was wiped out of his face after hearing the Queen's voice, Sir George, you have received warnings due to using an elemental ability in public space and destroying the drop's property. The third strike would result in reducing your salary from 70,000 SC a month to 50,000 SC for three months. That can't be. Pained, George clutched his heart tightly at the thought of having his salary getting butchered by 30% for three months. If he knew that those rules were in the drop, he wouldn't have dared to act cool even if he was beaten up. Alas, the moment the plane placed them on the island, they rushed straight away to the meeting room. Thus, he was still clueless about everything in the drop. Whatever, at least it didn't go to waste. George showed a forced smile to the pumped-up juniors and walked behind them. They were heading to start their first session of training. Chapter 312, First Session of Training with the Team In five minutes, Felix and the rest had reached the VR training building that appeared more like a standard modern ten-story structure. Go to your rooms. I will send you the invite in two minutes. George informed them while entering one of the many rooms in this building. Sasha, the assistant instructor, followed him inside and closed the door behind them. Upon seeing so, everyone split up and went to their designated rooms. Each room had only ten beds placed next to each other. Five on one side and five on the other. Since the paint was white and the bed sheets were also white, those rooms truly appeared like hospital wards. After Felix laid on one of the beds, he closed his eyes and logged into the UVR. He then went to the Ivy League City's teleportation circle and used the invitation link of George. Soon, his body disintegrated and was constructed in George UVR's room. The moment he opened his eyes, he found that George was in the process of modifying his room to the Galactical Elemental Football Stadium. Honestly, he didn't need to do it manually as he could request the Queen to copy-paste the stadium here. Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number. Underscore 521850529220437636 for visiting. Obviously, all of those modifications done weren't cheap. Felix knew that after the modification, the Queen would calculate the length, height, width, thickness, and added detail from the basic white room. Then, she would smack George with the bill of the modification. 
for an elemental football stadium, the bill could reach up to millions of coins. Nevertheless, the modification would remain permanently until Gioge decides on remodeling again. This was the reason Felix preferred using the training center rooms instead of his UVR's room. It was much cheaper as he only needed to pay 200k or so for a year. However, UVR's rooms were also not useless as the owner could invite as many people as the room could fill. This made it the perfect training ground for teams, hosting wild parties, and such. If it wasn't for the ESG organization knowing that the price of hosting the world competitant inside those rooms would be too much to stomach, they would have done it already. In their eyes, it was better to use an earthling forest than spend tens of millions to recreate one in the UVR's private room. Even if they destroyed the real forest, they could always recover it using the cheap resources of the UVR. Currently, George had most likely been given a budget by the ESG organization to recreate the map games in his room and use them as training grounds. It was a hundred times better than training in reality as those juniors could get hurt, killed and have their energy wasted each time. While it was good for the rest of the team, Felix would have a big problem to deal with. That was teleportation fees. Felix couldn't possibly be teleporting from the Ivy League and George's room every day since the fee was 200 GP, not 200 SC. Felix wasn't planning on wasting that kind of amount to practice with the team every day. Thus, he swiftly sent George a mind message since everyone was already in the room. I will practice with the team today, but I will not be showing in the practice runs for the next week since I have some business matters to take care of in the Mariana Empire. George immediately stopped his modifications and turned to glance at Felix. Seeing that he had a forced smile and a sincere look, George knew that Felix didn't just want to skip practice to laze around. He spent enough time with him to understand that if Felix ever felt lazy he wouldn't even bother to lie as he would say so to his face. However, it was still quite irresponsible for the team captain to skip a whopping seven days of practice. Not to mention, they were the first ever days of practice. He knew that would leave a bad impression on the rest. I don't mind, but make sure to act sick or something. George shrugged his shoulders and sent a message, otherwise, it might appear like you are putting your private matters above the team and the planet. No one will like that. Don't worry. I will take care of it. Felix smiled faintly as he nodded his head in appreciation. This was why he was glad that George was their main instructor. They spent enough time together to form a bond. If it was any other instructor, they wouldn't hesitate to reject Felix's request. Although George fulfilled all of his requests, Felix knew his limits. Thus, he planned to spend those days practicing the three tail techniques in Silver Hammer School until he wouldn't need the instructor to fix his mistakes. Then, he could start training them in the training center in the Androxa capital. After all, the machines or the monkey path weren't unique designs or such. They could totally be recreated in the center. Just like that, Felix would be training his tail techniques while not missing his team's daily practices since the teleportation fees would be just 200 SC. After a couple of minutes, George dusted his hands after placing the final touches in the stadium. Felix who was sitting on the L.U.S. True's green grass of the field, turned his head around in an attempt to inspect the erected stadium. Well, it shouldn't be called a stadium since George had just copied the football field and not the spectators' seatings to save costs. The football field was the same as Earthling's football field besides some exceptions. Firstly, the entire field was encased inside a humongous glass dome, making it impossible for the ball to leave the field. This meant, in the elemental football, there were no throw-ins or corner kicks. The players could hit the glass dome with the ball and it would return to the inside keeping the game in play. This dome was placed since the players' strength was more than enough to kick the ball outbound every time they attempt to kick. Secondly, there were four transparent small domes at the corners of the fields. Their size was big enough for five people to lay down. Naturally, those were the healers' clinics inside the match. Thirdly, the goalposts were a lot bigger than the Earthling known dimensions, 7.32 mx 2.44 m. 
it was made as such to make it easier to score goals. Especially when there were elementalists that could create walls, barriers, and such. The material used for the field was natural grass that was tough enough to handle some elemental abilities. If an area got destroyed, the grass could recover to its previous state in mere seconds. After all, it was going to be impossible to play in a ruined field. Clap clap. All right, gather around me. George clapped his hand twice to attract the team's attention who was spread in the field, touching here and there. After they grouped around George, he snapped his finger and created a large basket filled with white balls stripped in black and had an SG logo on them. He lifted a ball and placed it under his armpit. He looked at the team and said, In my team, I never pick the strongest member but the most useful member depending on the situation. So, you can expect that I will be replacing the main team members with reserve members in case they demonstrated better results than their peers. Well, Felix and the rest of the national team weren't surprised as they expected nothing less from George. After all, he willingly kicked Amelia from the national team and kept Nathan even though she could totally win against him. However, the rest had different reactions as the reserve members were clearly more excited and appreciative while some members from the main team didn't seem like they liked George's method. Not bothered by their disgruntlement, George threw the ball to the ground and said, The first practice will be for testing your current football skills without the use of elemental abilities. He shrugged his shoulders, since I am not really a football coach, the organization is going to send a coaching team tomorrow to take care of your football drills. Naturally, the ESG organization wasn't going to make a total amateur like George teach the team how to play football properly. It wasn't just football but any other sport that he had no experience in. The team needed professional help and the organization was going to provide nothing but that. Sasha stepped forward and said while pushing her glasses upward her nose, me and Mr. George would be mainly responsible for figuring out the best use of your abilities in the field. So, you can expect that some of you will be natural strikers while some will be best for defending. All right, let's begin. After saying so, George snapped his finger and they were all teleported in front of the goalpost. Then, he went to place the ball on a white circle that represented the penalty kick. Captain Felix, how about you kick off the practice with a goal? George grinned widely while pointing at the empty goalpost. Why not? Felix smirked confidently and broke off the pack, heading to the ball. After reaching it, he tried to lift it with his foot for a quick dribble. Alas, he hit it barely twice before it fell to the ground. Cough, it's a bit difficult to control my strength for a soft dribble. Abashed by his trash skills, Felix swiftly created an excuse for himself. While the girls curled their lips in scorn at his excuse, the boys didn't dare to comment as they were planning to use the same excuse when they fail as well. Unbothered by those looks, Felix fixed the ball on the white circle and stepped a few meters back. After glancing down and noticing that his shoes were running and not football, he opened the VR store and did quick browsing. Upon seeing this sight, everyone realized that they were unequipped to play football. Even George. Thus, they all started browsing for shoes. As for the outfit, the sports outfit they had was good enough. Meanwhile, Felix had just picked black shoes and closed the window. Let's start with 80% strength. After making up his mind, Felix took a deep breath while narrowing his eyes at the ball. It appeared like it was zoomed right in his face. After marking where he would be kicking, Felix sprinted in those few meters for momentum and swiftly kicked the ball with his footbridge. He couldn't miss the ball with those eyes of his. Peeing. Whoosh. Alas, scoring a goal was a completely different matter as the ball had struck the upper metal post and flew into the sky. For real. Stunned, Felix's widened eyes kept following the flying ball as it traveled in its journey. Everyone else was also paying attention to the ball with lips parted slightly in disbelief. They could see that the ball wasn't heading to the glass ceiling but the other side of the field. The more they looked at its path the wider their eyes got. They knew what was about to come and they didn't dare to believe it. Alas, 
the ball didn't care about any of their thoughts as it simply landed on the ground and bounced twice before smashing into the net of the other goalpost. Dumbfounded and quite speechless, everyone started glancing between the ball lying on the net's embrace and Felix's stupefied expression. However in a split second, Felix coughed twice and said nonchalantly, just as planned. He then walked back inside the pack with his hands in his pockets, completely erasing the memory that he had just missed an empty goalpost. Shameless. Everyone scoffed at Felix's attempt to play it coolly. But, they didn't dare to mock him for it since he still ended up scoring a goal. George didn't know whether to laugh at Felix's garbage aim or applause at his godly luck. Whatever it was, this goal was the perfect one to kick off the practice. Chapter 313, Goalkeeper Candidate After Felix's kick, George requested everyone to do a penalty kick as well. Some of them butchered it like Sylvia who kicked the ball with her toe, sending it flying towards the glass wall behind the goalpost. Meanwhile, some like Leo and Ronaldinho had shown fine control as they easily kicked the ball towards the direction they wanted. After the penalty kicks, George carried on with free kicks, dribbling, passing, ball control, and other tests to check on everyone's current level. Although those were just basic tests on the first day, they were still quite effective as they helped George make a list and rank everyone's skills from S tier to F tier. Unsurprisingly, Sylvia was placed in the F tier while Felix was in the C tier. Leo and Ronaldinho were in the A tier. The rest were placed in different tiers. Naturally, some reserve members were as good as Leo and Costa. However, since elemental football and battles were occurring in the field, abilities usefulness was considered. Even Sylvia with her garbage skills could be part of the team due to her butterfly mutation and area of effect ice active abilities. She might not touch the ball as much as the rest but she could make sure that their opponents wouldn't touch it as well. After all, Random fights were forbidden but in the case of the ball? Everything was allowed to take it or remove it from the player's possession. There was no foul or penalty for smacking someone in the face. Heck, one could commit a murder in the penalty zone and the referee wouldn't say anything. This was the difference between deadly games and normal ones. Death was the core of supremacy games and it would remain as such in every game. If the spectators didn't like watching deaths and just wanted to spectate a peaceful match without those high stakes, there were other platforms in the UVR to fulfill their wishes. Heck, there was a galactical elemental football league in the UVR for football teams around the universe to compete in without worrying about dying inside of a match. But, the rewards and stacks weren't even 2% of what Supremacy Games was offering. After all, SG planets were fighting for their freedom and climbing the ladder of the Alliance and not just playing games for entertainment purposes. The same applied to individual games where the players were fighting to grow stronger and fulfill their desires. Real death was supremacy games. This fact had remained unchanged for millions of years and millions of years to come. That's why George was planning to create a 12-member team that would have perfect attack and defense synergy between them in the field instead of just the ones with the best football skills. However, this was merely the first day and there was still a lot of work. Thankfully, George and Sasha weren't just recently elected, but right after the world competition had ended. So, they had 15 days to learn about each bloodliner in the team and their abilities. Well at least their iconic abilities. That's why they straightaway started the practice instead of making the bloodliners introduce themselves and their bloodline abilities. After a couple of hours, the field was packed with juniors either dribbling the ball, passing between each other, or simply sitting on the ground thinking deeply about how to utilize their elemental abilities to their advantage. Boom. Boom. Meanwhile, at the side of the field, Noah kept throwing a ball in the air then smack it with his ice mace towards the glass wall. Where's the F asterisking foot in this? He was literally playing baseball with his mace. However, it wasn't against the rules since he didn't touch the ball with his hands. Yet, no one was paying attention to him as most free team members were gathering around the left side penalty area. They were currently watching five of their teammates continue to kick the ball simultaneously at Hina Suzuki, 
who was guarding the goalpost with her tiny body. Yet, none of them managed to bypass her and score a goal as a wall of water kept raising before those balls and engulfed them. She then would send those balls back with a mini tsunami and gesture with her finger for them to kick again, using whatever ability to boost their kick. I guess we found a goalkeeper candidate. Sasha said calmly while recording Hina's performance next to George. Unconvinced, George scratched his bearded chin and said, Not yet, we need to test the limits of her oceanic wall against stronger kickers like Felix. He sighed, We might not know which planet would be placed against us but it isn't far-fetched that their team will be packed with peak first-stage bloodliners. This was George's primary worry about the games. Their team might look strong but he knew that their strength was weakest in the entire platform. He already watched some planetary games of teams playing for the first time. Every one of them had only one or two first stage greater purity bloodliners. The rest? All were peak first stage bloodliners. Although those teams were also newcomers in the alliance and playing for the first time ever, it didn't mean that their strength would be the same as Earthlings. This could be due to many reasons. 1. Their planet's environment wasn't as gentle and peaceful as Earthlings. Instead, it could be hot to the point 51C degrees would appear like winter to them. That's due to their bodies forcefully evolving throughout the years to adapt to that environment. This had nothing to do with bloodlines, mutations, or such. Just basic biological evolution for survival. Just like beasts had evolutionary traits, humans also had them. It just depends on the environment they were born and grew in. Those evolutionary traits obviously would give them a slight advantage in integration as they could handle more pain. Handling more pain led to integrating more percentages than earthlings who integrate on average 4% to 5% each time without supporting portions. A second reason could be the population of that said planet. While Earth was populated with 8 billion humans and still increasing rapidly, some planets would have only a hundred million or even fewer. It could be due to the previous wars wiping the majority off the planet, tough environments to survive in, or a mutation in their genes making them have difficulty giving birth. There were so many reasons to mention. But what mattered the most was that the fewer the population the easier it was for the planet to be united. This would facilitate the team's creation and provide them with resources to integrate right at the beginning. Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number. Underscore 521861645132692924 for visiting. Meanwhile, Planet Earth created a team just in the last four months of their first game. And only now would the ESG organization start providing double percentage potions for those who excelled in practice and games. We still have four months. Sasha mentioned, it should be enough to push the main team into reaching at least first stage greater purity and some of them into the peak, like Sylvia. George nodded his head firmly and said, they might be still slightly weaker in integration but they could still win the upcoming game if they exerted themselves to the limits in this duration. That's exactly why I suggested prolonging their daily training to 12 hours instead of your 6 hours. Sasha stressed her point with forceful prolonged eye contact. Jorga merely chuckled at her low-key display of challenge. He knew that she was bitter about being an assistant instructor and felt like he stole her position. She might not show it due to her professionalism but in his eyes, her displeasure was written all over her face. But did he give a crap? Nope. George earned this position and he wasn't planning on letting himself get pushed down by his assistant. Thus, he just turned down her mad suggestion with a simple no and requested calmly, please tell the captain to use all of his strength against Hina's oceanic wall. Okay. Displeased, Sasha let out one word through her gritted teeth and sent a message to Felix. Upon receiving it, Felix stopped his kicking practice with Leo and Ronaldinho who were helping him improve his aim. I will be back. I have been given a task to test Hina's ability. Felix said while passing the ball to Leo with his head. Then he quickly walked in direction of Hina, who was getting C.O.C.Kier by the second due to the strikers failing to score even a single goal. 
When they saw his destination, Leo and Ronaldinho traded glances between them before sprinting after Felix while dribbling through the juniors with stylish maneuvers. After they passed Felix and kept going on like that, Felix wanted to catch up to them by copying some of their moves. Alas, in the first maneuver, he ended up in a different direction and the ball in another direction. With a face thicker than a brick, Felix ignored his ball and carried on his sprint without it. He had no intentions to associate himself with it anymore. Ha ha ha, what a loser! While those who saw him didn't dare to shame him, Asna didn't hesitate to laugh at his tragic dribbling attempts. Immune to Asna's mocking tone, Felix stood next to Leo and Ronaldinho after reaching the penalty area. They weren't the only ones here as more and more juniors kept gathering to watch Hina's goalkeeping strategy against 10 strikers combined shots. She actually increased the number. All of them were allowed to use their abilities on the ball or even on Hina. As long as they keep their distance, everything was allowed to score a goal against her. Yet, she was still nullifying all of their attempts while at the same blocking their shots. It was clear that even though she shared Olivia's short height and cute face, she was a force to reckon with in the team. Well done Hina. Keep it up and you will be picked as the goalkeeper of the team. While the girls kept cheering at the side with their fists pumped in the air, the strikers were getting more and more unwilling to concede. Alas, their hearts might be unwilling but nothing much changed. Thus, they could only kick their balls away and retreat in defeat. Who's next? Smug and quite c.o.c.ky, Hina shouted while placing her hands on her HIPS. Chapter 314, Aim Still Garbage doesn't matter though. Just as Felix wanted to step forward and get the task over with, Leo stopped him with his arm and said, leave it to us captain. Have fun at it. Felix shrugged his shoulders nonchalantly and stayed in his place. If those two were able to bypass Hina's oceanic walls and tsunamis, the test would be considered done without him doing anything. You go first. Leo patted Ronaldinho's back and waited behind him with his hands crossed above his chest. Before Ronaldinho could nod his head, Hina pointed at both of them and said with a condescending tone, Both of you shoot together. I don't have all day to waste. Leo's eyebrows twitched at Hina's newfound arrogance. When they met her at the beginning, she was calm and gentle. After a couple of successful blocks, she turned into an arrogant little princess. If no one stopped her, it wouldn't be long before she self-appoints herself as the captain and Olivia as her vice. Ronaldinho, make sure to go all out. Leo merely requested without moving from his spot. Instead of replying, Ronaldinho placed the ball on the white circle and snapped both of his fingers. Sizzling. Sizzling. Immediately after, his body started to emit blue electric charges making his skin hair stand stiffly. No wonder he was bald and beardless. It seemed like he struggled quite a bit with his lightning element and bloodline. You ready? Ronaldinho asked calmly while staring at Hina right in her eyes. Go for. Whoosh. Before Hina could finish her sentence, Ronaldinho appeared like he teleported next to the ball and smashed it with his footbridge. The ball flew towards the left corner of the goalpost while appearing like it was made of lighting due to the blue charges it kept emitting. Shit. Seeing its speed, Hina knew that it was impossible for her to create another oceanic wall to block it. Meanwhile, the large one in front of her wasn't even close to the ball. Unlike the rest who were shooting at the wall since it was blocking most of the goalpost, Ronaldinho went straight for the corner of the goalpost. This made it apparent to everyone that he was going definitely going to score. However, just as Leo and Ronaldinho wanted to smirk in triumph, their eyes abruptly bulged out of their sockets at the sight of the oceanic wall expanding in heartbeat to cover the entire goalpost. Sizzling. T-S-C-H-C-H-C-H. The ball had clashed against the thick oceanic wall, producing lighting charges on the surface of it. Too bad for Ronaldinho. That's the only thing the ball had caused before getting engulfed inside the wall's belly like the others before it. Under the dumbfounded looks of the viewers, Hina reduced the size of her wall back to its original state and pulled the wet ball from within it. 
She smirked with her nose pointing at the sky and threw the ball back to Ronaldinho. Next. She yelled again. Whoa! Loud cheers and exclamations rose within the juniors as most of them were left in shock at the way she blocked one of the fastest balls ever kicked at her. She neither had to jump nor use her hands. Just relying on her passive expand and the oceanic wall would cover the entire goalpost. How could anyone score like that? Everyone's eyes brightened up as they could see that Hina was truly the best candidate as a goalkeeper. Your turn. Sympathetic. Ronaldinho patted Leo's shoulder and stood behind him. He had no plans to carry on embarrassing himself as he knew that no matter which angle he aimed at, nothing would change against her busted passive. Your kick was fast but lacked strength in it. Leo cracked his neck and said, against her wall, both were needed. He snapped his finger and the ball that was on his hand was starting to get covered by brown mud. A second later, the mud dried on the ball making it resemble a spherical rock. Yet, he was still not done as he didn't place the ball on the white circle but made it hover 20 centimeters above it. He was clearly ordering for his ability to hover which made the ball encased within it hover as well. If Felix did so with his poisonous abilities it wouldn't work since the mist wasn't solid. He might be a battle maniac but he isn't dumb. William Bentley praised softly while spectating next to a brown tanned man with black eyebrows, brown eyes, and short black hair. He had a sun tattoo on the middle of his forehead and vulture-like feet. They were right in the open as he wasn't wearing any shoes. They might bird's feet but they looked thick and the sharp bent claws kept emitting a dangerous vibe. But, will it work? The tanned man shook his head at the sight of Hina creating one more oceanic wall just to expand both of them at the same time. With this, she doubled her defense and placed every striker in despair. However, Leo just got even more excited as he yelled while sprinting towards the hovering ball, catch this if you can. During his kicking animation, those with good eyes managed to spot that his leg had turned brown and thick. Then? Boom! The loud sound produced from the contact was nothing like kicking a football as it seemed like two boulders smashing into each other. Yet, the clay covering the ball didn't even crack as it sped towards the oceanic walls like a rock thrown by a giant. Splash! Water was hurled everywhere as the ball went right through it like a bullet and existed from the other side safely. However, everyone noticed that its speed was somewhat reduced. Yet, just as they wondered if it would make it, the ball made the first contact with the water surface. Then? Splash! It managed to pass through it as well. Too bad, by the time that happened, Hina already created a mini tsunami and forced the weakened ball into a different direction. Ah! Uh. So close! Leo slapped his thighs while yelling in frustration. Meanwhile, Hina was wiping her sweaty forehead as it truly took a toll on her energy to defend against this shot. So scary, if that hit my face, I will die. I don't want to be a goalkeeper anymore. Hina's breaths quickened at the thought of being the goalkeeper for 90 minutes and against monsters even stronger than Leo. She knew that her wasteful use of energy was going to affect her and the team during the match. After all, her oceanic walls were indeed good to cover the entire goalpost but the ball's size wasn't even 1% of her humongous wall. Since her physical strength was just standard without any boosts from morphing or abilities, she wouldn't be able to jump and catch the balls. What's worse, even if she did, those balls would probably break her arms. While Olivia and the girls were cheering for her and shouting that she was the rightful goalkeeper, the ones who noticed this issue knew that she was far from getting that position. Felix knew that there was no point in him testing her anymore as the instructors had seen what they wanted. Thus, he turned around planning to get back into his practice. Alas, he was completely wrong as George sent him a message, go back there and show the girls why she wouldn't be the goalkeeper lest they beat me up for being a seasist. Upon hearing his request, Felix sighed and turned back. Hopefully, I don't hit her in the face find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number T matter though underscore 52205992749888551 for visiting. 
After seeing that their captain was heading towards the strike zone, everyone who was planning on withdrawing removed those thoughts and held their breaths in anticipation. Damn you captain! I don't want to be the goalkeeper anymore just let me leave with this achievement. Hina cried to herself while looking pitifully at Felix who was placing the ball on the white circle. She hoped that no one would challenge her so she could walk away with her head held high after getting a 100% blockage rate. Too bad, she knew that Felix had no intentions of leaving after seeing those dark green scales begin to cover his face. I should use all of my leftover energy to create five walls. Hina narrowed dark eyes at Felix and thought, I just need to block his shot and never approach the goalpost again. The instant she made her decision, Hina extended both hands forward and shouted cutely, Raise! Whoosh whoosh! Her cute voice definitely didn't match the abrupt raise of five humongous oceanic walls. Since her ability range wasn't that wide, those walls appeared like they were stacked together, creating a massive cube of water. Everyone knew that she went all out against Felix. They switched their vision to Felix, wanting to see if he planned on doing the same. Alas, even Felix was a bit muddled on how much strength should he use. His confusion was understandable as with his semi-morphing, Felix's current strength doubles just like his other stats. This meant, his strength now was equivalent to 6,600 bf. I think 60% should be enough. Felix wasn't really sure about the result as he never kicked a ball with that kind of force before. But, 60% should be more than enough to penetrate that big ass cube of water. After he made his decision, Felix retreated 8 meters from the ball and glanced at the goalpost for a second to register it in his mind. After having a clear picture of it and the dimensions, he picked the angle he was going to aim at and glanced one last time at it. He then placed his entire focus this time on the ball. Not all of it, but just the area where he wanted his leg to have contact. He didn't play football in ages and he was still really rusty. Thus, he was simply using the tips and pieces of advice that Leo and Roland Dinho had taught him in the past hours. Let's see how it goes. After getting everything in check, Felix left behind him a mirage as by the time everyone realized that he had made a move his foot was already in contact with the ball. Then, nothing. Absolute silence engulfed the penalty area as the ball neither made a sound nor did it appear in the eyes of the onlookers. Those who were gazing at Felix only saw his kicking animation. Those who were eyeing the cube of water didn't catch anything. Meanwhile, those who were looking at Hina only saw a cloud of blood in her place while the rest of her body was snared in the net with a smocking ball. Before those images could be processed in their brains, the sounds of the entire sequence had erupted at the same time. Boom! Splosh! Poof! Everyone closed their ears reflexively in pain as the sounds were deafening to bleed their soft eardrums. Even the slowest of them had realized that Felix had just broken the sound barrier with his kick and exploded Hina's entire head into a cloud of blood. Dear God! What a monster! Did he just f asterisking kick a supersonic ball? Their hearts couldn't help beat out of their chest in utter mortification as they looked at Felix's foot that was emitting smoke due to friction. While their minds had short-circuited not able to utter a word, Felix was scared shitless after seeing Hina's corpse. He knew that Olivia was going to complain all week long for thinking that he was aiming to pop her new bestie's head like that. For a known bully like him, she wouldn't believe that he was aiming at the left side of the goalpost instead of Hina's head. Those tips didn't help much to fix his garbage aim. But did it even matter? With his strength, he could score both the ball and the goalkeeper. Time to bolt. Felix didn't hesitate to teleport back to the Ivy League after paying the Queen 200 GP. However, after he did so, he didn't forget to leave his team and the instructors one last message. I have pulled my thigh in that kick, I would need a week rest to practice again. Until we meet again. Chapter 315, Preparing for the Gold Game Only after everyone received his rubbish excuse did they wake up from their stumper. Before they could react to his supersonic kick and swift escape, a sudden high-pitched shriek resounded in the field, he-e-n-a-a. Horrified and worried sick, 
Olivia dashed towards Hina's corpse that was in the process of disintegration. The moment she reached it, Hina's body got reconstructed again in a standing position as nothing had happened. Yet, her traumatized expression said otherwise. She kept parting her lips wanting to speak but the image of a white thing smacking her right in the face kept repeating in her mind. Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number. Underscore 522236614400355874 for visiting. That's the only thing she managed to see before her vision went dark. I, I don't want to play football anymore. If before she was scared shitless of being a goalkeeper, now she was terrified of being in the field. Seeing her trembling all over like she was standing at the summit of a windy mountain, Olivia quickly hugged her for warmth and cursed Felix under her breath for ruining her bestie in only two days. Take a break Hina and after practice, I will get you justice. Olivia promised with her tiny fist tightened in resolve. No one will bully my friends. Not even Felix. Alas, if only she knew that Felix had logged off and escaped to his residential room without any plans of emerging in the next week. Ahahina made an acknowledgement sound and logged off, planning to sleep it off and remove that traumatic experience from her life. The moment they saw that Hina was gone, everyone broke off in an excited and odd chatter. Captain is AF asterisking beast. He scored both the ball and goalkeeper. With him as our striker, I doubt we wouldn't be able to score 10 goals in the match. Edf, is it just me or his strength had increased? William wondered. Or maybe he never went all out against you guys. The tanned man with a sun tattoo on his forehead said, think about it, he had super strength passive that could have boosted him with 600 bf, a legendary enhancement boost after the etching process, then that semi-morphing ability of a legendary bloodline. Adding all of that to his 1000 BF base. Edef's eyebrows quivered slightly as he said, his peak strength was probably 3500 BF+. Plus. William's grey eyes widened for a second in shock before they regained their tranquility back. Indeed, the strongest of us here physical-wise is Zhang Wei. He currently has only 1900 BF. William smiled gently, it's good that the captain is even more stronger than he showed. Edef Acharya nodded his head in agreement. He understood that as a team that would place their lives in each other's hands, the stronger his allies were the better it was for his survival. It was only logical thinking and no one in the team had negative emotions about it. If it came to be, they would envy Felix's strength and wish to have it as well. Thus, all of them were pretty excited by the power of the kick especially the two instructors. Although George was slightly annoyed that Felix had traumatized Hina one of the top ten in the team, he was still happy about the final result. However, after remembering Felix's garbage excuse before leaving, he couldn't help but want to curse him out loud. Pulling his thigh in UVR? Needing a week to rest? F asterisking hell, faking his grandfather's death was more believable. George knew that no one reacted strongly to Felix's excuse because they assumed that he was joking to avoid Olivia's fury and he would join them tomorrow in practice. Alas, they were going to learn the truth the hard way. Damn you, Felix. Making my job harder than it is. George cursed in his mind one last time before teleporting in the center of the field. Gather around me, we will be playing a 12 against 12 matches. George sent a message that made all of them riled up. A practice match without Felix to break the balance. Sign me in. While they were getting split up into teams of twelves, Felix was driving his car to the training center in Androxa capital. Although he had already finished his Tales morning courses, he would still recreate the machines in his room and carry on his practice. Plus, he still needed to work on his daily poison manipulation. He could never reach the second stage in the elemental manipulation system if he didn't stay consistent with his practice. Consistency was the true key to success, not pushing the limits. Felix never forgot that he had only three months before joining the gold game and playing against the true big boys. Thus, besides his training, he never stopped seeking essence for his integration. 
his best bet was to reach greater purity before he got forced to play the gold game or get sent back to mid-tier silver. Felix had no intention of going back as gold games and above were the true money printers. After all, the live stream would be available to only those who were paying a monthly subscription on the SG website. Plus, the recorded stream wouldn't be accessed for free but purchasable. Meanwhile, the ticket prices would double than usual and stadiums would be much larger to carry more spectators. All of this was being considered as streaming revenue. Therefore, the players still had 20% to be split between them based on the known three methods, 3% for the champion 17% get split based on the number of fans each player had in the stadium and watching live slash gathered game points. The viewers would obviously be lower than usual since most commoners prefer watching games for free to keep their coins for more important matters. Ultimately, the games were just for entertainment purposes in their eyes, unlike the players who see them as a path for apexness and desire fulfillment. That's why from gold games upward, the stream wasn't regional in a specific empire but galaxy-wide. Besides adding more paying viewers, the Human Races SG branch was separating bronze and silver games from the rest due to them having the highest played games. After all, the number of players in bronze and silver was unfathomable in comparison to higher ranks. Especially in bronze where every new player gets placed in. Thus, to not flood the website with game streams from all around the galaxy, bronze and silver players from the same region slash empire get placed in one game. Just like that. Four birds were struck by one stone. The viewers who prefer watching the stream for free would be happy with the massive choices of bronze and silver games in their empire. The viewers willing to pay to watch stronger bloodliners fight against each other would have plenty of games as well since they would be having players from all corners of the galaxy. Due to that, the games wouldn't be too empty, having 30 or just 20 players instead of the average 100. After all, the higher players climb the lower their numbers get. That's due to deaths, difficulty to secure wins consistently, and such. Thankfully, game coupons would be more accessible the higher the players climbed. Every coupon effect was a huge help to the players. Just like the second reroll wheel coupon that Felix possessed. If he did not like the game he was placed on, he could totally spin the wheel again. This was just one effect from the many coupons out there. Finally, the massive profits gotten from those changes for both the Alliance and the players was the fourth bird. So why was Felix rushing to be a gold player? Because only then would he be part of the big league in the Milky Way galaxy where billions of coins could be obtained in a single game. After Felix reached his training room, he modified it to resemble the school with the machines. Then, he spent the next three hours doing nothing but repeating the three taught techniques. After he was done, it was already midnight. Thus he went to sleep. The next morning, he teleported to the Ivy League city and went straight to the school. After spending three hours in it, Felix logged out and made a quick call for Badadai to check when would the latest bottles arrive today. Badadai informed him that he would be there in the evening. As usual, Felix had bought five bottles from Goti. But due to the NDA contract that he signed, he couldn't really give his room's coordination to Badadai. After he spoke to Mr. Rodriguez yesterday, he was given an exception for only outer space deliveries. Mr. Rodriguez didn't ask him about his deliveries and such since they were private matters. He already knew that Felix was loaded in the UVR as it wasn't really much of a secret in the Maxwell family. Thus, he didn't find it abnormal that he would be using the Wormhole Express since Felix would be delivering only small items and they wouldn't be too expensive to ship. After Felix had dealt with Badadai, he went for lunch and logged back on to deal with some business matters related to his company. When he was done, he started training his poison manipulation. Before long, the evening had arrived and Badadai came right in time. He gave Felix his delivery and swiftly took off. Felix placed those five bottles on the floor and got nude next to them. He called for Asna and they started the filtration process. Soon, the final result was out, 5% from five bottles. It's getting worse and worse. Felix shook his head and placed back the five bottles in the spatial card. 
he left only the filtered 5% Sphinx's essence. Whatever, at least I got the 1% that I need. Felix removed those negative thoughts and started relaxing his body and mind. He was going to integrate all of it and reach 34% at once. This meant that the two active abilities would be unlocked and he couldn't help but get slightly excited at the thought. What would he unlock? Were they going to be lower active abilities common in other bloodlines or would there be something unique in them since this was the Sand Primogenitor bloodline? He was soon about to find out. Chapter 316, Three Months Later Two in One Three Months Later Peep! Peep! The annoying noise of the alarm abruptly went off in a darkened bedroom. It kept resounding for a couple of seconds until an annoyed mumble was heard from the bed, Queen, please turn it off. Sorry sir. Felix, you told me to keep it on until you wake up. Felix could only curse himself under his breath and open his muddled red eyes like he didn't sleep for a decade. The moment he stood up, his bracelet quietened down, bringing tranquility to the room again. However, Felix didn't return to the bed but just waved his hands at the window's curtains. Just like they got commanded, they parted to the sides, letting the warm sunlight of the morning brighten up the room. On his way to the bathroom for a morning shower, Felix kept yawning his sleep away while scratching his ass. He was truly dead tired as he barely slept two hours in the previous days. Today was a bit better since he slept an extra hour. All of this was due to his busy schedule caused by Ring Ring Speak of the devil and he shall arrive, as the moment Felix stepped into the shower his bracelet started ringing yet again. Doesn't he sleep? Is he a f asterisking vampire? Felix cried in despair at the sight of the caller. However, he still got hold of himself and accepted the call. Why are you calling again? Felix asked again in fatigue. Boss, Mr. Gamaga had specifically requested to have dinner with you to speak in detail about the acquisition of his VR game studio. Mr. Agrees went straight to the point. Don't wanna. Felix turned the shower on and complained, I told you that my schedule is already busy and I can't be dealing with any of those matters. Just tell them that I entered a coma or something and you are now the chairman of the company. Your jokes always delight my day boss. Although Mr. Agrees said so, he didn't seem laughing at all. So when should Mr. Gamaga expect you tonight? He asked again. He added after not receiving a response, Come on boss, it's just a dinner to conclude the deal. I have already gotten 16% shares and we desperately need his shares to obtain the managing right of his company. Upon hearing so, Felix massaged his temples from those pain in the ass meetings that seemed like they would never end. When his Primo Investment Company was successfully established two months ago, he didn't expect that it would eat up most of his time like this. But what did he expect would happen when he gave out many companies' names for Mr. Igris to invest in or acquire at all cost? Those companies' names were all extracted with the help of Asna from his memories. Naturally, for such a laborious task, Asna had to be motivated. Thus, Felix had named the first film studio that he acquired by using Asna's name. That film studio was merely one of the six companies that his Primo Hedge Fund currently owned. As for minor investments, they were placed in 13 different companies. All of them were going to make a breakthrough that would propel their companies to the spotlight. By Felix owning shares in all of them, the revenue gotten would be too much even in his perspective. However, some of them were going to make the breakthrough in months while some would take years. So it wasn't going to be instant gain. Obviously, to place so many investments at once, Felix's previous capital wasn't even close. Thankfully, the series had turned to be more than a bomb in the Empire as the viewers had embraced the first season tightly and were begging for more. Since we are speaking Empire-wide release in the best streaming platform for films, the revenue obtained was more than mind-blowing. Felix had earned 12 billion SC just him alone with 20% shares. Don't even mention the rest. Felix asked Mr. Igris to invest what he finds appropriate in the second season and use 5 billion SC as their investment hedge fund. However, 
By branching all at once in so many industries, Felix was left spending at least eight hours a day helping out Mr. Igris since it was indeed too much for him to handle. They didn't trust to leave important matters in the hands of the recruits in the company. Plus, it would be disrespectful to send a recruit to business meetings with other higher UPS. Felix didn't have time for any of that as his daily training routine was eating up all of it already. He needed to train with the team, his tail techniques, his poison manipulation, and also his unlocked sand abilities. Now, he barely had sleep in time and this was slowly affecting his mental state negatively which would impact his bloodline path. After all, no one could integrate without being fully ready to go for war with his body. Felix had no intentions of f asterisking up his bloodline path due to overworking himself to death for money. In his eyes, money was just one of the means to serve one's ends. Felix didn't want to fall in the pitfall of obtaining money for the sake getting more and more. Hence, this time he had no intentions to mess with his sleep by heading to a late dinner. Sorry, but I am not going anywhere tonight. Before Mr. Igris could argue back, Felix informed him, from here on, I want myself to be isolated from any investment matters. If someone asked for me, tell them that I had an incident and went into coma. Felix thought about it for a second and added, since you will be taking care of everything, I will push your shares from 5% to 8%. Don't worry. I won't be giving you any more investment targets. Focus on the ones we currently have. I. Sigh, as you wish boss. In the end, Mr. Igris just swallowed what he had to say and agreed. He could hear that Felix was dead tired and serious. Talk to you later. Felix added before H.A. hung up, don't forget to send me weekly reports of each company. I still want to know their progress. Of course boss. Have a nice day. Cluck. The call was disconnected to the relief of Felix. He truly hated the business world due to being time-consuming and energy-draining. He was a bloodliner first and foremost, not a businessman. He might have memories that other investors would die to possess, but Felix still had no intentions of fully committing to the business route. Queen, please play the morning news in the US. He requested while shampooing his hair. Immediately after, a grim voice of a woman resounded in the bathroom. I am afraid to announce that Houston City was completely turned dark after the power stations in the city had been raided and bombed by the Green Scuttle criminal organization. New York is about to be completely overrun by gangs and criminal organizations after their latest victory against the Marine forces. Boston is still struggling to get rid of the misfits criminal organization that was planting bombs in historic buildings. I will be damned. Felix frowned his eyebrows at the news while still cleaning his hair. Yet, the news didn't get better but just worse and worse in every American state. In some of them, drones were broadcasting an active war zone between U.S. Marines and gangs. Bullets were being fired ceaselessly and surprisingly the gangs had the advantage. How could they not win the zone they were fighting at was a populated residential area. The Marines would obviously hold back lest they end up killing innocent civilians but the same couldn't be applied to the criminals who had no issue doing it. Felix merely kept skipping one tragic news after the other. He was already numb to the tragedies that had been occurring since the moment the Gama's announcement had reached the public. It had happened two weeks after the first training session of the Earthling team. At that time, the kidnapping attempts had exploded in every continent to the point that even a retard could see that something was off. It didn't take long before the Gama organization's announcement hit the streets, making everyone understand the criminals' actions who were doing anything in their power to kidnap a bloodliner. After seeing the mind-blowing rewards in the list and understanding that the Gama organization's offers were as real as they could get, the commoners were affected one way or another. While some decided to hurdle in their rooms, scared shitless to even peek outside of the window, others saw the announcement as an opportunity. However, seeing it was one thing but growing the balls to go for it was another. Thus, only the desperate, greedy, mad and ambitious commoners carried their weapons and participated in the hunt for bloodliners as well. Since awakening was an achievement on its own, who didn't brag about it to their peers, friends, relatives, 
in circles? Besides few exceptions who didn't like attention, every other awakened junior had shown off either directly to his peers or just bragged about it online. This meant every one of them had placed a fat target on their heads after the announcement went live. Unless they lied about their awakening to earn praises and attention. Since almost two years had gone by, the first Awakeners had already been sent outside of the public camps to make use of their abilities. Some joined the authorities while some went for civil work. For example, fire elementalists and water elementalists could potentially be trained firefighters in those ten years of service which they signed with the country. This meant they weren't really hidden or protected but just out there like every other commoner. So, it wasn't really that hard to kidnap them unlike the newly awakened juniors who were still in public camps. However, some attempts worked and some were stopped by the authorities who were active 24 sevenths in every town and city. Alas, even when council had placed a worldwide curfew, banning everyone from stepping outside of their houses, the kidnapping attempts were still happening non-stop. This pushed the council to take a drastic move and place most of their marines in the cities and towns. Even a declaration was made stating that anyone spotted outside of their homes would be shot without warning. The world was in an emergency state and the council had to make drastic moves like those to save the situation. Obviously, the Karens and Kevins of the world were displeased by this decision since no one had the right to take their freedom even if there was a worldwide war against bloodliners. Too bad. The council had no intentions to use words to address their protests as they couldn't spare even a second of their time with those kinds of people. Thus, when one of them stepped outside of their homes, they get shot dead without hesitation. The marines were given orders and they were fulfilling them. Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number. Dash, two in one. Underscore five two 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 five seven eight seven one eight zero four one three zero five seven for visiting. After seeing through the news that the council was truly executing anyone who disobeyed the curfew whether they had weapons or not, most desperate commoners hurtled up in their homes, not daring to have any thoughts about going against their country. But the same couldn't be applied to the underground forces armed to the teeth and were rearing to take full advantage of this opportunity. They knew that it was impossible to take down the well-trained marines so they did what they know best. Play dirty. Some of them chose to drag marine squads to populated residential areas and turn them into war zones. Meanwhile, some gangs and big criminal organizations went full terrorists and started bombing buildings, starting a fire in forests, hitting the country's borders and unprotected important areas due to marines moving into the cities. All of this to force the authorities to split up and give them a chance to kidnap their targets. If it were any other time, they wouldn't have the guts to do this. But when the rewards were as good as mild longevity potions that could give them 300 extra years to live, greed took the best of them and made them use any method to get some. The Gamma organization made it even easier for them as the moment they participate in their first trade. They get offered cheap genome specifier needles to make them extract the abilities by themselves. This meant they could straightway trade abilities with resources instead of a bloodliner. It was much easier like this. For the biggest criminal organizations around the world, they were given plenty of needles at once so when they attempt to make a trade. It would be a big one, ranging from tens of abilities to hundreds. They didn't need to worry about crossing the borders since they were weak due to the chaos. Even if they couldn't make it to the US, the Gamma organization would send one of the contracted native middlemen on a hovercar that could fly with supersonic speed. This way, they could meet up midway, get the trade over with and then separate. Since the Gamma organization was doing this for a long time in previous planets, they knew that anti-surveillance was the key to carrying on the operations smoothly. Thus. The hovercars were installed with one of the best anti-surveillance systems that made it almost impossible for the Council to follow one and find the spaceship's coordination. Almost three months had passed, yet they were coming up empty-handed. The chaos happening in every town and city wasn't giving them a break to focus fully on the organization. Heck, in some places in the cities there was no running electricity as the street poles and cables were brought down either due to the aftermath of the fights or it was done intentionally by the criminals to put their territory of the city in utter darkness. 
Unlike the citizens who were quivering in fear and worry inside their darkened homes, the gangs and criminals thrived inside the darkness like devils raising to reclaim what they deserve. The world had truly crumbled in merely three months due to a single announcement. The council and ESG organization also had a part of the blame as the massive capital gotten from selling their planet's data weren't spent wholly on the citizen. Almost two years had passed by and 99.9% of the citizens still didn't have AP bracelets. It was understandable not to afford to give everyone bracelets but at least 2% of the citizens worldwide should be doable by now, right? Or how about treating the millions of sick patients in the hospital with the cheap resources from the UVR? The citizen didn't see any of this. However, the youthful faces of their leaders were always planted on their TV screens. Neither the citizen nor the criminal organizations were stupid. If there was 195 leader, and each of them embezzled 1 million for mild longevity potion, didn't that mean they had taken a total of 195 million SC? The things that could be done with that sum were too many to count. It was used for presidents that would change terms in four years to F asterisking eight years max. That's only the obvious embezzlement which couldn't be hidden. God knows how many millions each president had taken. This had already set off an outrage before but it didn't do much. However, it did show that everyone was frustrated and tired of waiting for the promised AP bracelets and other resources for more than two years. Thus, immediately after the announcement was published, it wasn't abnormal that some citizens would act out of their shells and fight for a piece of the fat rewards. While the citizen could be controlled by force and scare tactics, the gangs and criminal organizations had no intentions of stopping until they get what they deserve. They were done waiting for the council to give it to them. They had no qualms if the world burned for it. Chapter 317, Spinning the Wheel for the Fourth Game when will this chaos end? Just when? The female anchor cried for help in national TV, council, ESG organization, anyone. Please expel the Gamma organization from the planet. Plea. Whoosh. Felix waved his hand, turning off the hologram at once. He shook his head slightly while leaving the shower. He didn't like what the anchor had just said as he wished for the exact opposite. He didn't want anyone to find the Gamma's spaceship and attempt to destroy them. He knew that would serve nothing but make the organization change its coordination and hide again. At that point, he could forget about locating them again unless he decided to head outside of the island and repeat what he did before. This time, he might not be as lucky as last time. Felix wasn't looking down on the Council's strength but he knew that even if they decided to throw tens of nukes at the spaceship, they would be utterly useless. Not because their explosion wasn't strong enough to destroy the spaceship but because they wouldn't even go off. There were thousands of ways to stop a nuke from activating in the UVR's public information. If even the nukes were useless, how could tanks, jets, rockets, and other military weapons be of any use against that behemoth spaceship? Thus, the only chance the planet had was Felix's red plasma weapon. Only two months were left before his spaceship would be sent to him. He wished dearly that the organization remain hidden till then. Nonetheless, Felix didn't just cross his arms and watch the bloodliners getting kidnapped as he offered a bit of help as well since he wasn't losing much. That's by turning his private Sky Pearl Island into a temporary shelter for bloodliners. The island had already finished construction two months ago but due to the ongoing chaos, no one gave it the proper attention it deserved. Leela, Jack, and the rest of the staff crew were asked to remain there indefinitely. Honestly, they didn't even want to leave it as they could see that the world was far from peaceful like the island. After Felix was informed by Leela that it was ready for habitat, Felix decided to fortify it and turn it into a shelter that could hold as many bloodliners as possible. He proposed the idea to Mr. Roger Gass who gladly accepted the timely gesture. The island was almost perfect for shelter since it was isolated from the rest of the world while also having all the necessities needed for operation. It just needed protection and the council had provided so quite easily. Right now, the island was already packed with hundreds of thousands of bloodliners. 
The hotel had been fully crammed by four juniors sharing one normal room and six sharing a suite. Then, the residential area that was meant for staff and their families had been split into two halves. One for the staff and the other for the juniors. Finally, there were camps packed with tents in the forests to encompass the rest. If it wasn't for the island being not that big, the ESG organization would have moved even more to it since the public camps, military bases and such were all at full capacity by the bloodliners. Who would have thought that Felix's effort to turn the island into one of the best tourist spots on the planet would result in turning it into a shelter? Truly, plans were destined to change based on how fate willed them to. After Felix's nano suit morphed into comfy pajamas, he exited his room and walked to the elevator in the residential building. Cluck. Hearing the sound of the door opening, Felix glanced to the side and was met with the sight of Sylvia wearing a tight sport outfit while fixing her silver hair into a ponytail. Morning Sylvie. Felix greeted casually. Morning. Sylvia nodded her head in greeting, wholly ignoring the fact that he used her pet name. Felix had been calling her like this for three months straight until most of the team had started using it as well. She couldn't muster any resistance as she neither could shut Felix up nor beat him up. Thus, she could only numbly accept her fate. Heading for a jog around the island. Felix asked. Sylvia shook her head while pointing at her feet, I am going to work on my passing. You better work hard. Felix glanced at her football shoes and teased, with your tragic football skills, I doubt you will make it to the final team. Sylvia's eyebrows twitched in irritation at those demoralizing words that ruined her morning. Yet, she still didn't respond as he was indeed right. Unless she showed some improvement at least in her passing, George wouldn't pick her in the final team. If he did, he would place her as a substitute. After all, this might be elemental football, but they should still have some basic football lest they end up passing the ball to their opponents continuously. So far, the main 12-member team was close to shape up and Sylvia wasn't in it yet. She was being distressed about it all the time since she was the vice-captain of the team. It was quite shameful in her eyes to be second best in the team yet not participate in the first game. Hence, she stopped looking at the prick's face that needed a beating and jumped from the topmost floor of the residential area. Whoosh whoosh! Her gorgeous folded butterfly wings opened up midair and started fluttering, taking her to one of the entrances of the drop. Show off! Felix scoffed and carried on his walk to the elevator. T.I. ring! After reaching the ground floor, Felix stood on a black platform and hovered to the cafeteria to eat his breakfast. In a couple of minutes, he reached an open space that had hundreds of tables set in an ordered manner. Only a couple of tables were taken since it was still way early in the morning. After sitting on a random white table, he clicked on its surface and a holographic menu was manifested on it. Felix picked his usual breakfast and closed it. During his wait for food, Felix decided to dial Godi to check if he had anything in stock for him. Alas! he received a negative response just like the last previous times. Felix had single-handedly emptied Godi's stock in the last three months. In total, he had purchased two eagle species bottles, five cat species bottles, five serpent species bottles, and lastly seven lion species bottles. Yet, 65% of those bottles turned null while the 35% gave him an amount of 30% essence. This wasn't so bad considering that he had enough to reach 69% if he integrated all of it. However, Felix only integrated to 59% and kept the rest for later. He didn't want to reach greater purity and replace semi-morphing since he still needed it for the first planetary game. After all, he told them before that he had edged poisonous bombs so he could keep the five inducements forever. This meant, if he couldn't use semi-morphing in the first game, the only excuse he would have left to use was to tell them that he had reached peak first stage of replacement in those three months and replaced it. After all, in their minds, semi-morphing was his peak active ability but in reality, it was just his fourth active ability. Thus, to avoid all of this nonsense, Felix decided to stop at 59% temporarily. Plus, 
it wasn't like he would be able to use all of the sand abilities in the SG. He could only use six abilities plus one ability from his previous bloodline to appear normal. Since he was currently at 59%, it signified that he had unlocked four passive abilities and two active abilities from the Sphinx bloodline. Those abilities had replaced Poison Immunity, Super Strength, Poisonous Bombs, Poisonous Aura, Ultra Infrared Vision, Poison Revitalization. All of the abilities that he showed with his Landlord persona. This meant that Felix was going to join the game as a true Sand Elementalist with multiple Sand abilities. With this set of Sand abilities, Felix was more than confident to brutalize the Gold players just like Silver players. Even though he would be on the weaker side of physical strength, Felix wasn't bothered by it in the slightest after reading the unlocked sand abilities. The only reason he didn't participate in the gold game yet was because he was training with those new abilities to master them and also their synergies, tricks, tips, and such. Additionally, he wanted to time his game with the monthly gathering in the Ivy League city. After all, Felix would be participating in gold games which meant the prizes in the pool were good enough to be traded or bought by other bloodliners in the prize pool free trading market. He had no plans of giving up on the free method of getting extra game points. Just like the girl who sold him the uncommon elemental flower in the PPFT market. She had earned 2000 GP while doing absolutely nothing but display her prize pool to Felix. He wanted to do the same in the market after the game. The gathering was going to start in five days and last three days as always. That's why Felix was planning to roll the game wheel after breakfast so he could start the game exactly on the first day of the gathering. But now, the empty goatee's stock was still bothering him since he was already waiting for two weeks and still, he wasn't informed about a single bottle. Should I just buy from other shops? Felix pondered on this matter deeply before and he always rejected it since Godi's shop provided a hefty discount and also paid for the customs taxes. If Felix bought from other shops, the amount would be too painful for his wallet. What's worse, Luby started struggling again to pay up front since Felix had brought him too many bottles in such a short period of time. They weren't getting out of the shelves as quickly as before. Find authorized novels in, faster updates better experience, please click number dot underscore 522489641661143214132 for visiting. So, even if Felix bought from other shops, he wouldn't be able to get rid of them unless he entered a non-exclusive contract with other shops than Luby's. At this point, Luby was too valuable as a partner due to his black merchant status. Felix didn't want to strain their relationship lest he ends up needing something that was in Luby's stolen goods. I guess it's about time to start aiming for epic tier 6 bloodlines. Felix thought one last time about the matter before starting to indulge himself in the breakfast that was brought to him just now. After Felix finished his breakfast, he returned to his room and sat on the bed. He swiftly brought out his profile interface and clicked on a new game. After he was transferred to the next tab, he gazed at the green start button for a second before wishing softly, please be a battle format. Felix might be weaker strength-wise than gold players, but he still preferred battle formats due to their straightforwardness in gathering game points. Ting. 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 Not wasting time, Felix pressed the button and started staring at the spinning colorful wheel without blinking his eyes. Stop. After three seconds, he gave out his order and the wheel began to slow down a bit by bit. The needle kept being passed by format after the other. A second later, the formats were all in Felix's eyesight, letting spot battle format and focus on it. Come on, come on, oh oh. Abruptly, Felix's eyes shone in delight as he could see that the battle format was getting closer and closer to the needle while the wheel on the verge of halting. Ting. Ting. She's doing it. She's doing it. Felix's grin kept getting wider and wider at the wheel that was moving as slow as a snail while the needle was currently affixed on the black colored format. Alas, the wheel might be slow, but it still didn't stop. It kept going bit by bit until the needle touched a tiny part of a blue colored format. Then, it stopped. T.I. ring. 
Congratulations on picking a competitive lifestyle format. Chapter 318 Deciding to Participate Unresponsive, Felix merely kept staring at the holographic notification with a deadpan expression. He couldn't even muster a curse since he always had a tiny feeling that his garbage luck in the draw would strike again. He didn't think that he would be baited that hard like his first wheel roll. In the end, Felix merely closed his eyes and let out a long exhale. He soon snapped his eyes open and comforted himself, no worries, there are battles even in a competitive lifestyle. I can still win it if I focused fully on the win instead of points. Felix shook his tensed shoulders after regaining his wits back. He took a deep breath and placed his finger on the button for the second wheel. Then, he pressed it lightly and recoiled back in his bed. This time, Felix left the wheel to spin and spin until it gradually started to slow down on its own. He just closed his cursed eyes and kept waiting for the wheel to halt. Ting, ting, ti ring. Congratulations on picking the game, fish to survive. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. The moment Felix heard the term fish, he felt like a part of his soul had escaped his body. It was already bad enough to pick a competitive lifestyle format. Now he even had to be around F asterisking water. His sand element worst counter was water. Heck, even his poison element wouldn't do much underwater since it was mist based. Well, I guess it's time to use the second wheel spin coupon. Although Felix said so, he wasn't that impatient to change the game before reading its rules. He had absolutely no idea about this game's concept as he rarely watched competitive lifestyle games or land in one. Thus, Felix studied the side hologram that had emerged automatically on his right side. Slash slash game format, competitive lifestyle, fishing edition. Game name, fish to survive. Participants number, 70. The integration allowed, from lesser purity to peak stage 2 of replacement. Ranks allowed, silver and gold, this is a gold game. Limited. 3. Every participant will be given a basket with infinite bait slash a fish bucket that could never be filled slash and be used to feed the rainbow turtle. 2019. The game map, based on Kaogeania planet in the Andromeda galaxy. Surprise edition, yes. Prizes pool, high grade stones, peak grade stones. Purity Fountain Drops, Potion of Immorality, Seeker's Shoes Artifact, Wrist Webbing Artifact, Shield of Dominic. Rules of the Game 1. Each participant will have a rainbow turtle. 2. Participants will be standing on their rainbow turtles in the middle of the ocean. The area is limited. 3. Every participant will be given a basket with infinite bait slash a fish bucket that could never be filled slash a fishing rod slash one wooden boat and two paddles. 4. The game duration is 4 hours. It's split into two phases, easy slash difficult. Each phase is 2 hours long. The game starts with the easy phase and moves up to the difficult phase. 5. Each phase is further split into three stages, one hour for fishing slash half an hour for feeding slash half an hour for surviving. 6. Fishing stage. Use the material given to fish as much as possible in one hour. Place all of the fish in the big feeding bucket to be counted as valid. 7. The feeding stage. The moment one hour of fishing passes, the rainbow turtle will eat the fish from the big bucket. It will eat only the fish inside the bucket. 8. After half an hour of feeding, the rainbow turtle's shell will get tougher based on the amount and quality of the fish eaten. Every moving life forms in the Kaogeania planet can be considered as a fish and be used to feed the rainbow turtle. 9. The rainbow turtle's shell can turn up to seven colors based on its toughness, white, yellow, red, green, blue, purple, and black. 9. The survival stage, the rainbow turtle shell has an entrance on top that could be used. The participants are allowed to enter inside the shell for protection from an oceanic bestial wave. 10. The oceanic bestial wave strength will get stronger after every two hours or after each phase. Easy slash difficult. 11. 
fish that aren't placed in the feeding bucket after each stage will disappear. 12. Fish are split into five ranks, common, uncommon, rare, epic, legendary. 13. Game points can be earned from elimination, 400 GP, slash catching GP bundles slash catching high fish ranks. 14. The last player standing wins the game. If more than one player is still alive by the end of the game, the player with the highest amount of fishing points collected will be the champion. For more information please open your SG profile interface. Good luck to all participants slash slash. Well, that's one heck of a game. Felix couldn't help but let out a long exhale after finally finishing reading the game's rules and details. He was planning to read it swiftly with his eyes since he didn't have intentions of fighting with sand in a water-based environment, but after knowing what the game was all about, that thought was removed from his mind. However, Felix didn't do anything yet besides rereading the details and rules since he never saw this game before. The first thing that caught his attention was the name of the planet. Having a bit of understanding about the meaning of those first letters, Felix went and did a quick search in the UVR. What king type beast rules the Kaogeania planet? He typed this question and the result swiftly came up. SSSSSS. Felix gasped out loud at the image of a monstrous eight tentacled beast with an octopus head. The beast was wholly dark red and had tiny eyes at the side of its head. Yet, what sent shivers down Felix's spine were the thousands of teeth that were exposed due to the beast wanting to devour its prey. Felix glanced at the top of the image and noticed that the beast's name and details were written fully. The Great Eight Tentacled Kraken, a legendary Tier 6 beast. Before Felix could react to the beast's details, the Hormongondra said in nostalgia, his appearance is almost identical to the water primogenitor. If he was a hundred times bigger, had an additional 1,000 tentacles, and had blue inscriptions, I wouldn't even notice the difference. That close. Felix exclaimed in shock, doesn't that mean he probably possesses a huge amount of essence? It should be so. The Hormongondra guessed while scratching his goatee, for that kind of close similarity, he would need at least 25% essence. 25%? That's just the minimum. Felix completely removed the last doubts he had about going for epic tier 6 bloodlines and upon hearing so. They might be difficult and more expensive to secure than tier 5 beasts, but if one of them had that kind of essence, it would be worth it. Especially when he could place the bloodline back in auction houses after he purchased it. If he did so, he wouldn't be losing even 2% of the bloodline's price since those high tiers were always in demand. After all, there weren't enough higher tiered beasts for every bloodliner in the galaxy. That's just impossible. This meant, if Felix ever managed to buy one, he could easily sell it back and if he was lucky, he might earn a profit. The only risky side about this operation was that Felix wouldn't have liquidity after buying one bottle since their prices could reach up to 3 billion SC based on the bloodline's uniqueness. However, with the Primo Investment Company up and running with many projects invested on, coins wouldn't be that much of a problem now. Adding to the fact that gold games provide more profit than silver games, Felix could totally pull this plan off. Let's see how it goes after this game. Felix removed Kraken's image and said, Thanks for the info, Elder. Um. The Hormongondra merely waved his hand lazily while wearing cozy pajamas and drinking a cup of coffee on his bed. Felix went back to the game interface and moved down on the list. This time, he spent quite an extensive time on the prize pool since he could finally access the elemental potion materials. He soon read the 100 prizes and noticed that only purity fountain drops and the dark fly dust were available for buying. Although he had enough game points to buy them now, the prize pool wasn't accessible yet. Only after the game ends would the players buy what they want or start prize pool free trading. Not bad, there are three dwarven artifacts in my pool instead of one. It must be a bonus due to the hidden addition. Felix nodded his head in satisfaction after seeing the details of the Seeker Shoes, Hand Webbing Artifact, and Shield of Dominic. 
he was interested in buying seeker shoes since they could greatly buff his movement speed and help him stand on any surface. Even standing on the water was possible with those shoes. 2020 Although the price was 2,500 GP, they were worth it in his eyes. In fact, every artifact was worth purchasing if one had use for them. For example, the hand-webbing artifact could allow the wearer to shoot out webs from his wrists and swing around like a spider. The shield of Dominic could grow in size and also shrink, making it quite useful. Other ones were a hundred times better than those examples and also expensive as hell. Naturally, those artifacts weren't created by the human race but by the dwarf race. One of the ruling races in the SG Alliance next to the metal race, the witch race, and the rest. Felix always wanted to buy an artifact that was actually good enough to boost his strength instead of being a burden. However, those kinds of artifacts never make it to the Milky Way galaxy. It wasn't because they were super rare or restricted to purchase by individuals. It was simply due to the hostile relationship between the dwarf race and the human race. Chapter 319, The Real Artifacts and the Imitations This hostility was born after the humans had attempted to imitate the dwarf's artifacts by using technology and elemental stones. This happened almost 2,500 years ago. Well, it shouldn't be considered as an attempt since humans had truly succeeded in creating imitations. Those imitations were naturally not as good as the original artifacts. However, they were cheaper and more accessible than the dwarf race's artifacts. After all, just like how the witches needed to personally create potions and substances due to their innate trait, the dwarfs also needed to use their innate trait for artifact creations. This meant, they could never contest against the machinery and technology of humans who were pumping out those artifacts imitations like a candy factory. Despite so, the dwarf race didn't mind the competition at all as the only thing in their eyes was reaching the limits of artifact creation. Just like the metal race, who spend their entire time searching for the truth of the universe, the dwarf race had their own end goal. That was creating an artifact capable of changing the properties of minerals. An artifact that could turn coal into gold, stone into diamond, a piece of metal into the rarest alloys in the universe. The money gotten from their products was just a means to help them create better and stronger artifacts until they reached that height of creating such an unfathomable artifact. So they didn't mind that the humans were selling imitations. Thus, the dwarf race continued making artifacts and selling them like always. They weren't as expensive as before due to the imitations hitting the markets but they still didn't care. However, this all changed when the humans started doing what they knew best, letting their desires control the best of them. The number one desire that was always prominent in humans and goblins was greed. The demand for their imitations was starting to get out of their control as more and more customers all over the universe wanted to buy from them. Since their imitations could never be as good as the dwarf's artifacts, the humans couldn't really raise the price of their artifacts to match the dwarf's. If they did, no one would bother buying from them as customers would rather struggle and buy the real deal than an imitation with the same price. Just like on Earth, no one was retarded enough to buy an iPhone counterpart with the same price as the original device even if they were desperate. So, they asked the dwarfs to raise their artifacts price so they could raise their own prices for the imitations. Unfortunately, the dwarfs weren't that greedy and had their own principles about their products pricing. So, they got rejected without any chance to negotiate. While most imitations manufacturers carried on operating like normal after the rejection, some of them couldn't sit tight and watch free coins pass by them. Thus, they started to lower quality and increase the quantity. Obviously, the price remained the same. This was the greed doing. After all, even if the demand went out of their control, they could leave it be and carry on their operations normally. The quality remains the same. The price remains the same. The ones without artifacts imitations would be eager to get one and those who got it would be satisfied by the human's work. Too bad, in another alternate reality, they might have chosen that decision, but here? Everything went to shit after the new imitations hit the market. 
since the quantity had increased substantially there wasn't a draft anymore for artifacts and the demand was sated for a while. However, due to many pieces being sold simultaneously, the reduced quality couldn't escape getting noticed by the majority of the users. Especially when many of them ended up dying due to the imitations breaking or failing to work properly in critical moments. Imagine buying a sword that was supposed to freeze the target after contact. However, it ends up exploding in the user's hand during the strike. Or worse, buying shoes that were supposed to run on the wind to end up falling from the sky due to a short circuit inside the shoes. After all, they were created by a mix of technology and elemental energy, unlike the dwarfs who had an entirely different creation system. Ultimately, no one dared to use the humans' artifacts' imitations when their lives were at stake. Even though the majority of the imitations still had the same good quality. What's worse, those who already spent a hefty amount of money on them felt cheated since they could only throw them in the garbage lest they end up dead like the others. Hence, they wrote horrible reviews on the imitations in general, warning everyone from using them and even exaggerating the situation's seriousness. Those reviews were in the trillions coming from all around the universe, making everyone treat not just imitations but also real artifacts like cursed items that would bring death by a single touch. Whether one was a buyer or not, the majority was left traumatized by those reviews and didn't dare to touch any artifact. When it comes to items that could affect the shoppers' lives, it was a must to either buy the best quality or at least somewhat good. That's why everyone trusted the imitations in the first place. They were good. But after getting cheated like that? No one was going to repeat the same mistake. This affected the industry as a whole which in turn affected the dwarf race. They were peacefully creating artifacts in their galaxy and selling them to outsiders for money to create more artifacts. Their entire lives and world revolve around artifacts from the day of their birth to the die they die. That's why every artifact that was sold had only peak quality in its rank. They took pride in their creations and they refused to sell faulty artifacts or subpar ones. Thus, how could they accept having their creations getting spoken in the same breath as imitations? Alas, what's done was done, the industry was already f asteriskied by the human race and it needed years upon years until the artifacts regain the user's trust. Heck, there were even some who were willingly spreading rumors about the dwarfs' artifacts failing as well so more and more wouldn't bother buying them. This would lower the demand immensely which in turn make them cheaper. Since the dwarfs took pride in their artifacts, there was no way they would lower the quality to match the low price. This led to them losing massive amounts of coins in those transactions. All of this had resulted in the dwarf race completely cutting down all relations with the human race. There was a complete halt of trades between them. Artifacts, energy stones, and minerals ranging from alloys to gems. Nothing was sent to the Milky Way galaxy from the Dwarf's galaxy anymore. Nada. To add salt to injury, the Dwarfs made sure to add a clause in their contracts that their products could never be sold secondhand to the human race. Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience. Please click number dot underscore five two two seven three eight six nine zero seven zero eight five eight two one two for visiting. No one had any issues with this term as humans truly had a shitty image in other races' eyes due to their monetization plans done in the UVR. The final blow came from within the galaxy. Since the bloodliners were also affected by the artifacts imitations, they didn't dare to buy them even if they were cheaper by five times than their original price. This ended up killing the industry eventually in the Milky Way galaxy. Right now? Humans were the only race in the entire universe who had no official access to the dwarf's artifacts besides the gold games and above in supremacy games. Only now could Felix start buying artifacts that he needed from the prize pool and trade the rest to others. He didn't want to buy them before from the PPFT market since he would be required to pay a 5% commission to the seller. If he got unlucky, he might bid for them against others as he did with the uncommon elemental flower. However, after reading the stock of those three artifacts, his eyebrows frowned in annoyance. There were only one seeker shoes, two wrist webbing artifact, and one shield of Dominic in this game. This stock was for all of the participants. Whatever, 
I still have 9,000 game points after I spent 2,000 GP on buying a room in the Ivy League city. Felix closed the prize pool and smirked, no one in mid-tier gold would have the same amount as me. So, it's quite worth it to spend all of it to secure the artifacts the moment the game ends. Felix already calculated the amount required to purchase all of them would be 8,000 GP. Since he planned on keeping one seeker shoes, the price would fall to 6,000 GP. When he goes to the PPFT market, he could sell them at the same price. But he would be getting the agreed upon 5% commission. Only the rich players like Felix could afford to utilize this method as the rest wouldn't dare use their own game points to buy something that might not get sold. In worst cases, the item might end up stuck in their hands until they sell it cheaply or outside with supremacy coins. So, they would rather keep hold of their game points until they find an item that they were certain would be sold or fought for by others. As for the rest of the items? They would only use the usual method of getting a commission for letting other players shop with their prize pool randomized list. After Felix had dealt with the situation concerning the PPFT, he read the rules of the game. They were quite complex and simple at the same time. Felix kept reading them one by one carefully until he reached the 12th and 13th rule. Those rules were concerning the ranks of fish and fishing GP bundles. Felix knew that his fishing skills were non-existent but those didn't really require skills but just luck. Luck was closely related to numbers. After all, buying a single lottery ticket wouldn't have a higher chance than someone buying 100 lottery tickets. In the case of Felix, he had the numbers with his new active sand ability. Hehe, he, this game might turn out not so bad after all. Felix grinned widely while rubbing his hands together in anticipation. You are a cheat. Asna chuckled after reading what he had in mind. Thank you for the compliment. Felix smirked while closing down the interface. He swiftly logged inside the UVR as he wanted to test the plan's viability in his training center room. He was planning on copying the same environment and conditions of the game to see if his plan would work. If it did, he was going to break the balance of the game. Chapter 320, Entering the Game Hall Five days later, one hour before entering the game hall, Felix was sitting in his real-life room while browsing through his Fang Club's website. The only word that could describe the website chat's room was excitement. Pure excitement and eagerness of Felix's upcoming game. From time to time Felix would spot a hashtag that was used a lot in the chat, The Lord's Return. Well, it was to be expected that his fans reacted this excessively as their idol had gone missing for almost four months and when he finally registered in a game, it turned out to be an AF asterisking gold rank. Some of them were worried sick, spamming in the chat questions about Felix's survivability against peak second stage bloodlines while the majority were too excited to care. Felix had shown them too many miracles in the past games. They stopped doubting him and just believed in everything he was planning on doing. The only thing that brought the mood down in the chat room was the cries and whines of the poor fans who couldn't afford to watch either on the stream or live. The tickets were pricey reaching up to 1,500 SC and they weren't going to pay the basic subscription monthly fee of 20k SC to watch the gold game stream. But Felix didn't react much to their frustration as he closed the website and entered his spatial card interface. He scrolled down until he saw a blue small chest at the bottom. He clicked it and it was beamed on his hand. Felix opened the small box and brought out al.u.s.true's Azure Chicken Leg. This was Malonfish Chicken Leg, an item he obtained inside the hidden compartment chest in May's Shuffle. Felix always kept it in his spatial card, waiting for the day when it would be useful to him. Finally, he was going to participate in a water-based game where breathing underwater would be extremely useful. Is it really worth it? A bit hesitant, Felix brought the chicken leg next to his mouth and left it right there. His mind was telling him to eat it but his heart said the opposite. Who could blame him for reacting like this? The melon fish leg could potentially be sold for 300 million SC+. If it was going to give Felix permanent underwater breathing, he wouldn't even hesitate. Too bad, the effect was temporary, 
lasting for only a single year. This consumable item was perfect for people going on ruins exploration at the seabed of oceanic planets. But in the case of Felix, he was going to use it mostly for the games. He doubted that he would land in many water-based games in the next year. So, was it worth it to eat it or not? Slap! Felix smacked his cheek until it got reddened. But, his hesitant eyes were no more as only clear clarity could be seen in them. I would rather regret wasting money than regret not wasting it. Chump! Chump! Felix straightaway started biting on the leg and chewing with a disgusted expression. It might look like a chicken leg but it tasted nothing like it. Felix swiftly sprinkled some poisonous seasoning from his fingers on the chicken leg then continued eating in enjoyment. Poison could make anything and everything tastes delicious in the case of Felix. A few moments later. Felix went to the bathroom and cleaned his hands. He looked at his reflection in the mirror and waited for the morphing to happen. Based on its description, Felix would have two small gills growing right under his ears. They would serve as a body part responsible for breathing underwater. Since his hair was quite thick, they would be hidden properly. Twenty minutes later, Felix could be seen taking a shower while cleaning his bloody hair thoroughly. Well, it was bloody all right as the morphing wasn't instantaneous, clean, and painless. The process was exactly like obtaining a mutation from a bloodline. The only difference would be using a natural treasure instead of a bloodline. After Felix cleaned himself thoroughly, he went to the mirror butt and dot a dot k dot e dot d and started checking the newly emerged gills under his ears. They appeared like his skin was cut three times by a thin knife without blood spewing out. So even if Felix was bald, they wouldn't be noticeable at all. Unless one was too near. Good. Felix nodded his head in satisfaction and went to the already filled bathtub. He wanted to test them out. After lying down, Felix submerged his entire body inside the water while still holding his breath. 3,2,1 now. Felix exhaled deeply until not a single oxygen minuscule was left in his lungs. Then, he inhaled using his mouth. Obviously, he only ended up with water in his mouth. However, instead of gulping it down, his throat automatically contracted forcing the water to go through a tube-like path connected to the gills and then back outside. However, the gills had already done their job by taking the oxygen and spreading it in Felix's bloodstream just like what his lungs were doing. Naturally, the entire process happened subconsciously, just like how humans breathe passively 24 sevenths without even thinking about it. The morphing didn't just add gills and call it a quit but added an entire breathing system inside Felix's body that allows him to breathe underwater. Of course, it wasn't as efficient as fish or by breathing using his lungs. Regardless, Felix wasn't complaining about it as he was more than glad by the experience. He swiftly brought his head outside while touching the gills, wide open to expel the remaining water. After the process finished, his gills closed shut again while his throat uncontracted itself, letting Felix continue breathing with his lungs. Truly worth the high price. Felix touched the gills in admiration and a bit of reluctance as he knew that he would be losing them in one year. If you are done testing, then enter fast. Bored, Asna said while shuffling a deck of cards at a circular table. The J, Ramungandra was sitting in front of her while rubbing his goatee in absent-mindedness. Wait, let me log in first. Felix wore his nano suit that was already morphed into pajamas and went to his VR pod installed next to the bed. After taking care of the needles and such, the queen logged Felix in. Immediately after Felix opened his eyes, he closed them shut again and dove into his consciousness to carry on the tradition with Isna. Playing cards right before the game. This time, a new member joined them in this tradition making it even more lively than it was. Half an hour later. Whoosh whoosh. Felix's body started to get constructed inside a spacious lobby floored with a red carpet and had one giant crystal chandelier. The rest of the players were constructing randomly as well in this lobby. A split second later, he opened his eyes while stretching his hands behind his back. 
He glanced at the empty podium and went to chill in the corner until the MC of this game arrives. The moment he reached the wall, he rolled his tail three times, creating somewhat of a base, then he sat on it comfortably with a leg above the other. He then rested his cheek on his palm and kept looking around the populated lobby, checking the players and his opponents. As always, the lobby was as silent as a graveyard. Everyone minded their business and the bloodthirsty auras they kept emitting would make any commoner rethink his decision of approaching them. Not a single one of them appeared like a pushover. Unlike in the bronze games and silver games where there were some hardcore players and others just there to make numbers, in the gold games, everyone was an experienced fighter who survived many life or death situations. No one was here to fill numbers and Felix had no intentions of underestimating any of them. That being said, there were obviously some who were more dangerous or noteworthy than the rest. It could be due to their bloodline rank, their immense background that shouldn't be offended, or their abilities were too unique and deadly. Felix had marked two of those players. Currently, he was looking at the first one, checking him out. He was a man with golden skin, drooping earlobes, and milky white tattoos all over his n.a.k.e.d upper body. This was Golden Elixir, a deadly light elementalist who was using a legendary tier 3 bloodline. It wasn't easy to get one of those legendary bloodlines since their stock was always limited. Felix guessed that his bloodline could have cost him at least 600 million SC to secure in a private auction. This bloodline was worth the price since its strongest known ability allowed the user to compress light to a tiny dot capable of projecting a penetrative beam. The scarier part, that beam was traveling at the speed of light, making it impossible to dodge it even for Felix. He tested it out and had his entire head explode from the beam since his sand passive couldn't react at the speed of light. Heck, even if Felix had his super strength, his body would still fail to defend against it since the attack was from a legendary peak second stage bloodliner. Felix's strategy to deal with him was to avoid at all costs and fight only when forced. The second bloodliner that he marked was an elegant girl, who was wearing a black kimono and carrying a sheathed katana. She was referred to as Miss Mikasa. Felix marked her only due to her known high IQ and unique fighting style that was combining two elements and sword techniques. While Felix was checking Miss Mikasa, most of the gold players had glanced one time in his direction at a minimum. Some just glanced at him and focused on other matters while some kept staring at him openly. Every one of them had a different thought in mind about Felix's participation in the gold game with his pitiful strength and integration. He really participated hey. Thought he would use an exempt coupon and dodge the game find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number dot underscore 5227736839545647 for visiting. Hopefully, his rainbow turtle get placed near me. It seems like he replaced his bloodline. Keek, he must have lost most of his busted abilities from that broken ass bloodline. No one seemed like they were looking too highly on Felix or fearing him like the previous game's players. Why would they? They knew that Felix had been given only four months to join this gold game or return to silver. Four months weren't even close enough to reach an integration that could threaten them. Most of them guessed that he would be utmost at greater purity if he had an above 75% affinity rating and was using double percentage potion always. Meanwhile, the weakest of them was at greater purity second the stage of replacement. So no one felt threatened by Felix even though they watched his highlights and saw his achievements. In their eyes, Felix was merely playing in a puddle of water with small fish. Only now did he join the big lake where the big fish reign supreme. Felix could see how they looked at him and knew what was going in their mind since he would have felt the same. However, he neither spoke nor smirked under his hoodie. He just kept eyeing the podium, waiting for the MC. Who will it be this time? He wondered in intrigue. Chapter 321, Rules Explanation After a couple of minutes, light particles began to gather above the podium. The players all raised their heads and focused on it wondering just like Felix if they were going to get lucky with a nice MC or a strict one. A moment later, 
the process of teleportation had ended, leaving behind a short girl who was dressed in a maid outfit. Awkward silence abruptly descended in the lobby as everyone was staring at their embarrassed judge fiddling with the corners of her maid dress. Sorry for appearing like that. The short girl clarified with an annoyed tone, I have lost a bet and was forced to wear this in my game. Looks cute on you, miss. Lisa. Miss Mikasa complimented with a soft laugh. You really think so? Lisa did a semicircle on top of the podium and an abrupt shower of praises and compliments started raining on her from the rest of the players. No one dared to laugh at her as they knew that Miss. Lisa might look like a child but her true age was in the hundreds. She was a veteran MC with a thousand games under her belt. They shouldn't mess with her lest she ends up switching her cute childlike persona to the real monster she was. All of you are so sweet. Delighted, Miss. Lisa giggled softly with her eyes crinkled. Just as some players wanted to praise her even more, her expression was changed to cold real quick as she said, I'm Elizabeth Sansolia, and I am your judge and god in this game. She smiled cutely again and said, but you can refer to me as Miss. Lisa. Not waiting for the players to respond, Lisa clapped her hands lightly, and the same large screen descended behind her back. Felix looked at it and noticed that it was showing a giant white-shelled turtle that was swimming slowly on a peaceful ocean. It had a long wrinkly neck that was thick from the bottom but thin at the top. Even the head was extremely small compared to its giant shell. Ta-da! Lisa extended her hands at the screen and said in happiness, This is your fishing buddy, your land, your protector, and your only source of survival. The Rainbow Turtle no one seemed surprised or reacted differently as everyone had already done their research on the Rainbow Turtle after reading the details of the game. As far as they got, the Rainbow Turtle was one of the few pacified beasts who never launch the first attack or attack back if assaulted. They had only two instincts, one for eating and the other for surviving. Thus, they spend the majority of their long long lifespan either eating or hiding within their shell. They weren't named Rainbow Turtle just for the fun of it as their shell color truly changes based on its current toughness. I see that all of you had done your research. Lisa nodded in satisfaction and said, but those are just the real details about the Rainbow Turtle. In this game, we have changed some things about the turtle to make the game more fun and fair. Lisa pointed her tiny finger at the turtle's shell and enlarged it on the screen. Then. She pointed at a small hole that was in the center of the shell and clarified, you are allowed to enter inside the shell in all three stages of each phase. Whether during fishing, feeding, and survival. The only difference is that during the survival stage, the shell entrance will be closed immediately at the last 10 seconds before the stage begin. Meanwhile, in other stages, it will always stay open. Although this raised some questions in everyone's mind, they kept them to themselves until the Q&A segment. Lisa snapped her finger and the screen started showing a transparent like glass. She looked at their confused expression and said, while inside the shell, you will be able to see everything that was happening outside of it. Everyone sighed in relief at hearing so. Based on the old games like this one, they thought that everything would be dark inside the shell. That was a horrifying experience especially during the oceanic bestial wave. So, they were glad that the game's rules changed slightly. Obviously, this change wasn't a surprise addition as it wasn't really a change that affected the core of the game. One last thing about the shell. Lisa snapped her finger and the screen started displaying each shell with a different color. She pointed at them and said, I can't share with you the amount of fish needed to change colors or if the current shell color was enough to resist the bestial wave. Before the players could voice their complaint at such a piece of dastardly news, Lisa said, All I can tell you is that you will be allowed to see the fishing points in other players' possession after each fishing stage. I mean the total tally. This is quite bad for me. Felix scratched his chin as he thought, If my amount was exposed, everyone would paddle towards my turtle and beat me up. Oh well. If they could find me in the first place. Felix shrugged his shoulders carelessly and carried on eyeing the screen which was now displaying a peaceful area of ocean. Although you will be placed in an ocean, 
the area is limited to 30 square kilometers. All of you will be placed randomly in this area. Although 30 square kilometers wasn't even close to the size of an ocean, it was more than enough for players to not meet each other at all. Everyone was weirded out by this fact as they knew that the Alliance wouldn't make such a fatal mistake of putting the players miles and miles away without the ability to bridge the distance and fight. Well, their assumption wasn't wrong in the slightest as Lisa had soon informed them that every player could order their rainbow turtle to move. The speed of the turtle was kept at 100 km per hour. However, they could only order it to move during the fishing stage and the feeding stage. I don't have all day long for slow explanations. So. Lisa clapped her hands with a cute smile and said, let's jump straight into the Q&A. Immediately after, players started raising their hands one by one. Lisa pointed at a man whose nose bent in a weird shape and said, you with the pig nose, ask away. Can we fish above the turtle shell or is it a must to use the wooden boat? Irritated, the man asked with his eyebrows twitching. You can fish wherever you want. Lisa answered with a silly smile. Thank you. Although he was confused by the smile, the man still showed his appreciation while placing his hand down. Next. Is it going to take forever to get one fish? Don't worry, the bait is special as it can attract a lot of fish for it. Lisa added, so if you can't fish anything, you should consider changing the spot. Next. What if our fishing rod or boat broke apart? They are tough to withstand a physical force equivalent to 3,500 bf. So anything unrelated to fights will not break them apart or sink them. She shrugged her shoulders and said, if they end up getting broken. Well, think of a solution by yourselves. Next. Our GP bundles and rare fish species depend on luck to get or the area of fishing. Find out by yourselves. Next. Can we steal other players' turtles and control them like ours? Yes. Next. How many fishing points each rank gives? 50 for common 100 for uncommon, 300 for rare. 1,000 for epic, 5,000 for legendary. Next. What happens to dead turtles? Do their corpses remain throughout the game? No. The moment a turtle dies, it breaks into light particles. So protect them at all cost. Next. Can we know the strength of the bestial wave? You don't need to know it as even fourth stage bloodliner wouldn't escape it. Lisa advised them. So focus on fishing and don't even entertain the thought of trying to survive against them without the turtle. Next. Can we know what this game's unique title will be? Lisa's eyes instantly brightened up after hearing so. I was waiting forever to get this question. What kind of impossible mission is she going to put this time? Felix's eyelids twitched at the sight of Lisa's excited expression. He knew that she had a weird habit of placing impossible missions to complete for the unique title since she had already given out her MVP title in one of her thousand games. Alas, no matter what guess he had in mind, it never came close to what Lisa had just shown everyone on the large screen. Did you like it? Lisa clapped her hands in pure thrill and exhilaration at the sight of everyone's stunned and horrified expressions. Scree! They ought to feel horrified as the great eight-tentacled kraken had emerged from underwater and let out an ear-piercing screech at the sky. This game unique title is. Lisa extended both of her tiny arms at the screen and shouted cutely, The Kraken Slayer. Chapter 322, We Have Long Awaited for Your Return. PFFFFF. Ha 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 ha. Asna immediately started laughing her ass out after seeing that everyone was left mortified in their places. Even Felix was staring at the screen with his lips parted, too shocked to react. Kraken Slayer. F asterisking hell, they didn't even know that the Kraker was going to be in the game. Who could blame them though? It was a legendary tier 6 beast. Even a hundred men squad with peak 5th bloodliners wouldn't be able to hunt it down in the ocean. It was just impossible. That's why the planet was referred to as Kaoceania. It still had the letter of the Kraken since no one managed to hunt it down in its optimal environment. 
Hee hee, how did you like the surprise addition that I proposed to the Alliance? Lisa asked with a sincere smile. The players didn't reply as they had only one question that was coursing in their mind, is this old B asterisk TCH talking for real? Alas, they looked at her sincere eyes and knew that she was dead ass serious. Everyone started to get agitated and furious at her intervention that was going to cost them their lives. They knew that MCS had the potential to forward suggestions about additions in the game since they were jumping from one to another every five days. Yet, no one had anticipated that the Mad Witch would take it this far. However, they still took control of their rage lest they end up offending her. Miss. Lisa, may I ask if the Kraken is going to have the same strength as its real counterpart? Miss. Mikasa asked politely without showing any signs of anger at Lisa. I wish. Lisa sulked while kicking the microphone, I wanted for the real Kraken to be added in the third phase and call it extreme, but the Alliance rejected the notion. She sighed in dejection and disappointment, so, I asked them to lower its strength to a legendary tier 3 beast. Only then was it approved to be placed in after the second phase, lazing for extra 15 minutes. In addition, its position before respawn was going to be transmitted in the entire map and it wouldn't be able to move freely underwater. Every player felt like they were given a second lease of life at heartwarming news. They knew that by making Croc and Match peak second bloodliners, it meant that his defenses were in that range as well as his abilities and physical strength. Which was a huge difference from before. Although the Kraken's strength was butchered and even was forced to stay in its place, it was still impossible for them to hunt it down alone since its size was left untouched. The beast was at least 100 meters tall without mentioning its tentacles which were double that number. Who could slay this monstrosity? Who? The Kraken Slayer? Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number, underscore 522966087919757573 for visiting. What a joke, they wouldn't even attempt the idea of trying to slay it even if it was for the MVP title. Don't even mention for a useless unique title that was for bragging rights. Alas. Those thoughts were uprooted from their minds after hearing Lisa suddenly add with a tempting voice, For your information, the one who slays the Kraken would automatically win the game and have his wish granted doubled in limit value. All of this plus the awesome looking title tag. Just as greed was starting to set their hearts on fire, the players breathed deeply through their noses, calming themselves down. The only reason they survived for so many games was due to their emotional control in those kinds of situations. They knew when to retreat and when to advance. At this moment, there was no way in hell that it was for advancement. Felix was also tempted a bit to go for it since doubling the wish value was indeed too good to give up on. Maybe, if I used that I can con, no forget it. It's too much of a risk and it's going to be quite high profiled even for me. Felix rejected the notion with a head shake and stopped thinking about it. He already had victory set in stone if he just followed the original plan that he practiced in the past five days of preparation. Tisk, cowards. Lisa cursed out loud after seeing their unmoving expressions. No one was baited and she didn't like that one bit. Miss. Lisa may I know. No. Lisa rejected a player's question flatly and snapped her finger with a cold expression. That was the last image she left as she had teleported outside of the lobby without even concluding the Q&A. Asna, believe it or not, that's how you sounded in the past year. Felix said with a proud look, I am glad that you are maturing slowly and changing your... F asterisk CK off. Annoyed, Asna flipped Felix the finger while watching him in her bed. Cough, never mind then. While Felix was messing around with Asna, the rest of the players started to gather in small groups of twos or threes, seeing if it was possible to start alliances. Obviously, it wasn't banned. Since the rules of the game didn't forbid two players or ten entering one shell, this meant it was possible to work together to raise the toughness of a single turtle. However, due to the fact that all of them would be dropped randomly in the ocean, Creating an alliance at this point wasn't really as good as in some games. 
But, at least if they met each other, they could instantly ally together. Unsurprisingly, many players had approached Felix for a partnership as well since they believed that he was the weakest in the game and it would much easier to fight it out with him after they break apart in the later stages of the game. But, Felix just waved his hand at them dismissively, not bothering to even address their invitations. Even the Katana girl had approached him but was sent back. No one created a fuss about the rejection as it was to be expected that not everyone would be accepting their invitations. After a while. It's starting. Felix looked at his fingers that were in the process of disintegration and mused one last time, my fans will probably change the name of the club after this game. Landlord. Misaka. Golden. Elixir. Surreal. Fog. Felix opened his eyes to the deafening noise of the stadium which he didn't hear in four months. He raised his head and started looking around him. With his enhanced vision, he could clearly see the reddened cheeks of most spectators as they screamed at the top of their voices while using their hands or gadgets. Unlike the bronze and silver games when the spectators were placed quite randomly, Felix could clearly see that the stadium was separated into fan clubs based on each player. That's right. Each player had a fanbus that was supporting him either live or on the stream. Most of the players were supported due to their gameplay and not looks like most famous idols in silver. This was to be expected as gold players needed quite a lot of wins to reach their rank and stand above the rest. That's why the chance for Felix weren't as good as his last silver game. His fan club was merely one of the 71 in the stadium. Just like there was going to be a war in the game, there would be one in the stadium as well for cheering. Leader Emma was currently having her foot placed on a metal pole while wearing a bandana on her head. She had this letter, painted on cheeks with green color. It simply meant L in the common universal language. Behind her, there was an army of fans wearing a uniformed green and purple t-shirt while having the same letter painted on their thrilled faces. This is the next stage for our club. Our Lord had brought us here in mere three games. So let's make a worthy entry for him. Leader Emma brought the hand speaker in front of her mouth and chanted with her eyes closed shut, Landlord of Inducement Club. Make some noise. woo oh ha ha Landlord. 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 The stadium rumbled as millions of Felix's fans screamed at the top of their voice, sending a united chant that overpowered most of the other fan club's chants. Misaka. Drowned. Surreal fog. Drowned. Even Golden Elixir's name was getting engulfed by Felix's fans. Unbelievable. Did his fandom really grow to this degree from three games only? Lisa and the players were shocked by Felix's fans' overzealousness that made them appear more like worshippers calling for their lord instead of fans. Yet, the target of this fanatic attention merely smirked and said casually, I am back. Everyone managed to hear him as his head was zoomed on the large screen by Lisa due to this situation. His fans embraced those three words with a single emotional and harmonized response that almost bled their ears, We have long awaited for your return. What's a loyal and passionate fandom? This was it. Chapter 323, Teleporting on the Rainbow Turtle Alas, Felix's fandom couldn't maintain this dominance for too long as every other club leader felt challenged by them. Thus, all of them started chanting their unique cheers created specifically for the idol. But neither leader Emma nor the fans cared about it as they had made the entry they wanted for Felix. Now now, Save your throats until the game begins. Lisa requested cutely, we only have 30 minutes of interviews after all. The spectators started to lower their voices one by one until the stadium was back to its original state. Rody and bustling but not outright annoying. Upon seeing so, Lisa jumped on her commentary platform and snapped her finger with an eager expression. Immediately after, a wooden broom manifested on her hand. Lisa placed the broom between her legs and jumped in the air under the cheers of the viewers. Whoosh, find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number dot underscore 523189270526547864786 for visiting. Instead of plunging, 
the broom flew in the air under the fine control of Lisa. She didn't stop there as she made a few tricks, hyping the mood even more. The moment the players saw her enjoying her falling demonstration, they didn't know if she lied before about her losing the bet for the maid outfit or not. Whoosh! Thud! Lisa finally landed on the ground next to the players. She threw her broom in the air and bowed to the spectators like she was a theater performer. He he he, let's see if those bastards would cheat me out of a good review after this. Lisa dusted her hands and skipped towards Miss Mikasa. She wanted to start the interview segment with her since she left a good impression in the game hall. Unlike Zoe and Meliodas who were willing to do anything to interview Felix, Lisa didn't even entertain the thought. Firstly, he still was blocking the interview, negating any attempt she thought of. Secondly, he wasn't even close to being the main focus of this game. In her eyes, Miss Mikasa and Golden Elixir had the highest chances of winning the game and glamorously. As for Felix, she doubted that he would even make it to the top 10 in this game. He was way out of his league. Hence, the interview segment went as expected without Felix receiving a single question. Only this time, it was a personal choice. Felix, you are being looked down upon by that lowly. Asna mocked him while chewing on a handful of popcorn next to the board J, Ramungandr. Well, the J, Ramungandr wasn't interested in watching the game as he felt that dramas and movies were more enjoyable than watching Felix's childish fights. But, he was dragged by Asna against his will as she didn't want to watch alone. Unlike him who was still binge-watching Felix's collection, Asna had already watched them twice and was bored to the death by them. Hence she was excited to watch every one of Felix's games. She will change her mind just like they all do. Felix scratched his cheek nonchalantly while eyeing Lisa skipping from a player to another, utterly ignoring his existence. Before long, the interview segment was concluded and Lisa had created the same broom and flew towards the commentary table. She didn't sit down as she was too short to be noticed. So she kept standing on the commentary table with a pink mic clutched tightly on her hands. She brought it closer to her petty mouth and shouted passionately, The moment you have all waited for. The final countdown. Simultaneously to her shout, everyone raised their heads and focused on the big timer on the screen that was counting down from 30 seconds. While the players were getting their emotions and mentality in check, the spectators waited with held breaths in anticipation at the final 10 seconds. The moment it reached, everyone started counting together. 9, 8, 3, 2, 1. Goo! Whoosh whoosh whoosh! At the same time, every player started to deconstruct into light particles, marking the beginning of their teleportation. Obviously, there was no free drop in this game due to the game's map and details. If everything went well, this might be the easiest game in my life. Felix mused one last time before his body was fully deconstructed. On top of a peaceful and tranquil ocean, a humongous white-shelled turtle was floating in its place without breaking the serenity of the atmosphere. Since its head and limbs were buried inside its shell, it appeared just like a white island from high above. Alas! This tranquil and beautiful scene was broken abruptly by light particles gathering to form the shape of a human. A split second, Felix's clothes were the first to manifest. He was wearing black pants and a black hoodie that had a grey wolf's head in the center of it instead of the yellow smirky emoji. Soon, his ash-grey tail was reconstructed as well. The bulky end of it was white. Ah, nothing beats the atmosphere of the ocean. Felix couldn't help but comment in contentment after opening his eyes to the sight of the sunlight reflecting slightly on the blue ocean water. He turned around and noticed that nothing was on the horizon even though his eyesight allowed him to see further than anyone else. Just as Felix wanted to turn on his infrared vision and do his usual one kilometer scouting, he was reminded of the fact that it was already replaced with another sand passive. Damn it! It's going to take a while until I completely forget that I have lost my infrared vision. Felix smiled bitterly while walking on the humongous shell, which seemed like it had the size of the same arena in the national tournament. Clearly, 
the Alliance wanted the players to not get held back by the environment during their battles against each other. Those with water element were going to thrive here but those without could still manage themselves on top of those humongous shells. After Felix walked for a while, he finally reached the center of the shell. He was aiming to come here to check on the entrance to the shell. Oh! It's slightly bigger than what I practiced within the past five days. He thought to himself as he studied a dark hole that absorbed all light, making it impossible to see what's within it. Even with Felix's night vision, he couldn't see anything. Its size was three meters radius, making it easy to put anything inside of it. Felix did a quick run around it and abruptly jumped inside without hesitation. Thud! The moment his feet touched the bottom surface, the darkness inside of the shell would draw back. This allowed Felix to see the mesmerizing underwater world through a transparent glass like he was inside a tourist submarine. However, there wasn't single fish or any life form in sight, making Felix raise his eyebrows in confusion. Felix went towards the transparent glass and placed his hands on it while narrowing his eyes in front of him. After zooming in like an eagle, Felix's eyes managed to spot thousands of unique fish from known and unknown species all swimming hundreds of meters away from the rainbow turtle. Not one of them entered the hundred-meter territory of the rainbow turtle. After seeing so and remembering the question asked in the game hall, Felix chuckled in a miss.e.m.e.nt. No wonder that Mad Witch smiled like that. It was plainly obvious that the rainbow turtle had been modified in the game to force fish to stay outside of its zone. Neither Felix nor the players knew this since the real rainbow turtle didn't have this kind of aura or pressure to force fish away. This meant, if the players wanted to fish, they would have to do so while being hundreds of meters away from the turtle. Naturally, doing so was was extremely dangerous as players could have their turtles stolen from them. This was going to add some sort of pressure for the players during their fishing as they would always be on the edge about someone sneaking up and stealing their turtle. Lisa and the viewers were currently looking at the ugly expressions of the few players who noticed this problematic issue. He he he, we didn't give you a boat so you can fish on your turtles. Lisa insulted with an innocent smile, what a bunch of dummies. Meanwhile, Felix could care less about this issue. He simply looked at the entrance and jumped outside of it. The dimensions inside the shell and outside were utterly different, making it easy to enter and leave. After standing back in the open, Felix looked around him and soon found a large wooden bucket inside of a brown wooden boat that was placed near the edge of the shell. Felix swiftly went towards those materials and started checking if they were the same ones that were used in his practice runs. Good, nothing changed. Felix sighed in relief after seeing that everything was the same. Even the small bucket of bait that was inside the boat or the long modern-looking fishing rod. The materials were the same and he couldn't get any happier about the results. Since it implied that he could carry on his plan that he prepared specially for this game. Let's start cheating. Felix grinned widely while placing his hand on the wooden boat. Then, he murmured to himself, perfect sand copy. Chapter 324, The First Active Sand Ability and the Third Passive Immediately after, golden particles of sand started to get emitted from Felix's other hand. After a proper amount was released, the sand automatically started to get shaped up exactly like the brown wooden boat. In the beginning, it was just a basic version of it like the boat was made by an amateur but as seconds went by, the sand particles kept reshaping the boat over and over again making it extremely detailed. By the time five seconds went by, the sand stopped being emitted from Felix's palm as the boat had been wholly copied from size, color, and details. Everything was the same even Felix would be fooled by which one was the real boat or the copy. Good, first one fresh from the oven. Felix grinned faintly and withdrew back his hand. Then, he placed it on the fishing rod and activated the same ability. Unsurprisingly, it went smoothly as the first copy. Yet, Felix didn't stop as he placed his hand on his chest while the other extended away. He then copied himself. At the start, it was just a body full of sand but as seconds ticked by, Felix's skin, clothes, tail, 
and everything else was copied fully under the dumbstruck look of Emma and the rest of his fans. Am I seeing things? Is that sand or a new form of poison? Are we really spectating Landlord? By now, the fans' brains had already short-circuited as the sight was too much for their minds to process. They were always anticipating what poison bloodline Felix was going to use in his first stage of replacement and if it was going to provide Felix with the same number of inducements. In fact, they were not the only ones waiting for such as most VIP viewers from massive backgrounds in the galaxy came specifically to watch Felix's second bloodline in detail. Even Princess Bird's horrifying background was here to inspect Felix thoroughly. Was it going to be legendary or epic? If it was legendary, was it going to be as unique and abnormal as the first one? They needed to know since if Felix had used a second legendary bloodline and was still able to cast abilities with many inducements, this was going to change everything. It wouldn't be that Felix had lucked out on an abnormal bloodline which could have a 0.0001% chance of happening due to mutations of beasts and such. It would appear that he possessed a trait to either make bloodlines have more inducements than it should be or it was due to a genius geneticist who found a way to enhance bloodlines and remove their limitations. Whatever it was, they wanted IT. They needed IT. But what the F asterisk CK was this? Why was he using sand element instead of poison? What kind of ability was that? They came seeking answers and they ended up having more questions. Too bad. Felix wasn't even close to finishing as he repeated the same process over and over again until ten boats, fishing rods, bait buckets, paddlers, and ten copies of himself were created around him. Felix clapped his hands twice and the lowered heads of those copies were all lifted at once, showing different expressions under the lower half of their hoodies. The upper half still had that darkness hiding it since it was within Felix's rights to not show his face at all. Then, every one of them started moving on their own. Some started stretching while others were yawning lazily. Heck, one of them had even gone to pick a fishing rod and started studying it carefully. Felix who was standing in the middle unmoving was the one who looked like the goddamn copy. Dear Lord, I must be dreaming. Shocked silly, leader Emma rubbed her eyes twice while switching her sight from one clone to the other. Her reaction was shared by every viewer who was watching Felix exclusively since he wasn't yet focused on the big screen. While she was simply shocked, the VIP viewers who were more knowledgeable, started to converse with each other. The question most asked in their conversation if they had ever seen such an ability before? Alas, every one of them shook their heads even some individuals with hobbies of collecting unique abilities names and effects. However, they still knew of abilities that were quite close to what they were seeing. The ability brought out the most was Sand Copy. It allowed the user to copy physical objects just like Felix's ability. However, there was a chasm between the abilities and reality. Sand Copy could utmostly copy the shape of an object and couldn't really make it move freely or interact like Felix's copies. Instead, they needed to be controlled manually by mental energy just like Felix was controlling his poison bombs. But seeing Felix chilling with hands in his pockets while the copies were carrying the boats and fishing rods, made them understand that it was impossible for those copies to be controlled manually. Inside one of the VIP rooms, Princess Bird, who was wearing an outfit made from green leaves and had yellow bangs covering her eyes, was currently jumping on her place in agitation while pointing her finger at Felix. See. What did I keep telling you for the past six months, father? She huffed, he is too weird and needed to be investigated properly. He might possess a way to evolve bloodlines or boost abilities. Alas, the middle-aged man who was wearing a brown robe that had a hexagon eagle logo in its chest, merely shushed her down with a hand wave. He rubbed his beardless chin and thought in intrigue, another bloodline with unknown abilities. This is getting interesting. While the VIP viewers were focusing more on the ability itself, the rest of the spectators were staring in disbelief at those copies placing their boats on the water and jumping inside with a fishing rod. Then, they started using the copied paddlers to row in different directions away from the rainbow turtle and Felix who was still standing on the white shell with the original materials. Don't you dare come back empty-handed. 
Felix shouted with a threatening tone. Alas, the only response he received was ten middle fingers pointing at him from all directions. Pfffff! You reap what you sow. Asin laughed in ridicule, if your personality wasn't nasty, your copies would have been much nicer. Felix's eyebrows twitched in annoyance but he didn't retort Asna's claim as she was indeed right. The moment Felix unlocked perfect sand copy at 30%, he got excited for merely an hour by the ability's details before he was left without tears to cry due to the asshole attitude of any living being he copied. That's right. Birds. Assholes. Fish. Narcissistics. He even created a virtual image of Olivia in the measurement center and copied it. The result? Lazy Olivia. All of this due to Felix's six deadly sins. Narcissism, prickness, indifference, laziness, pride, shamelessness. The copies didn't really have a consciousness to control them. Instead, they were acting based on Felix's personality and they react to anything just like Felix would. Thus, when he threatened them playfully, they simply responded with a middle finger since that would be most likely Felix's reaction. Since his personality wasn't really a pretty one, Felix was struggling to deal with his copies just like everyone was struggling to deal with him. However, that was a tiny price to pay for such a busted ability that allowed him to copy perfectly anything his hands touched. Naturally, besides, liquid, energies, and innate traits of life forms. It was even able to copy 20% of the properties of the original version. It might not seem like a lot but it was an unthinkable achievement that left Felix awed by the Sphinx's mysterious ways. Find authorized novels in, faster updates, better experience, please click number, underscore 523387961082415055 for visiting. After all, to copy a whopping 20% of elemental properties meant that it was possible for wood to float on water and burn on the fire. For metal to melt and for ice to harden even more. 20% was making all of those reactions possible even though the base element was sand. Felix had absolutely no f asterisking clue how the primogenitor of sand managed to achieve this feat. Even the J, Ramongandra and Asna were left stomped. However, all of them agreed on one fact. It was impossible to do so with just sand element, there was something added into the mix to make it possible. This thought process wasn't illogical since Felix wasn't really unlocking elemental abilities that were strictly elemental. Instead, he was unlocking abilities from the primogenitors. They could be anything. Based on J. Ramongandra's words, they had experimented and created a lot of shit due to their infinite boring lives. For the Sphinx to be referred to respectfully as the guardian of truth and knowledge only meant that she was extremely smart and had more of a research mentality, unlike the J. Ramongandra who devoured planets on his spacewalks. Although Felix didn't understand how the ability truly worked, he wasn't complaining in the slightest about its effect. He could clearly see that all of his copies had already reached a hundred meters away from the rainbow turtle and were currently placing their baits in the fishing rod's hook. Although he could see them from afar with his enhanced vision, Felix wasn't really relying on it to look. Instead, his eyes were switching from one copy to another, making him see and also take control of the copy if he willed it. This wasn't due to perfect sand copy but his third unlocked passive, sand senses sharing. It enabled him to share the senses of anything that was made of sand. As long as the sand belonged to him and was fueled by his elemental energy, he could even share his senses with a ball of sand. However, since it didn't have either ears, mouth, nose, etc., he would be able to feel only touch. This meant, for him to utilize this passive perfectly, he needed to use it on life forms copies. However, it had a fatal drawback. During it, Felix's senses from his original body would be detached just like he was unconscious. Thankfully, he had a snow looking out for him every time he used it. F3, stop lazying around and start fishing. F4, I swear to God that I will replace you if you don't stop looking at your reflection on the water. F2, you little dipshit. Stop returning the fish to the ocean. 
While the viewers were left speechless by the sight of ten copies each fishing in their own ways, Felix was about to lose his mind by their behaviors. This was the reason why Felix bothered to share his senses instead of supervising them from afar. The F asteriskers were just as unreliable as he was and needed babysitting. Chapter 325, The Fishing Stage Damn it, if only they had brains. Felix cursed in his mind while creating another copy of himself. This time, he ordered it to keep watch on the shell. Meanwhile, he went to copy the rest of the materials and went to the ocean on his own. He had only one hour to fill the feeding bucket as much as possible before the next stage arrives. Although ten copies fishing at the same time was already breaking the balance of the game, Felix still wanted to fish personally since those copies could be destroyed any time by a marine beast or a giant fish that was too much for them. Naturally, those beasts and fish were nothing before Felix and the rest of the players but in the case of the copies, they would be destroyed quicker than an eye blink. This was another weakness as those copies were more like servants to help and not combat ability. Switch the camera focus to landlord. Switch. The camera focus to landlord. While Felix was rowing further and further from the turtle shell, his fans were shouting for Lisa to focus on him instead of Miss. Mikasa, who was slicing fish midair before placing them neatly on the boat for space. Miss. Mikasa's method is quite smart to save up space on the boat. Lisa ignored Felix's fan screams and carried on her commentary, the infinite feeding bucket is too big to be placed on the boat. So, this will minimize the times required to go back to the shell for emptying their boat. Lisa clapped her hands and added, let's check on how Golden Elixir is performing. N-O-O-O. Landlord. Landlord. Show. Landlord. So annoying. Lisa arched her eyebrows and took a glimpse at Felix's screen. Seeing that he was just about to set up his bait in his rod, she lost all of her interest. She didn't know what those fanatics were yapping all about and she decided to ignore them thoroughly next time. If only she could see that ten more Felixes were fishing at the same time, she wouldn't have switched her vision back to Golden Elixir so fast. Interesting. Golden Elixir is using his light element quite effectively. Lisa exclaimed in surprise and enlarged the image of Golden Elixir who was currently dropping tiny and compressed light balls that were shining quite brightly. Lisa went on and explained to the viewers that light particles were able to attract small fish. Once the small fish get attracted, they bring with them bigger ones, which feeds on them primarily. While the viewers were engrossed in listening to Lisa's commentary and watching Golden Elixir, Felix's fans had already returned to watch him with their omnipotent vision. They could only give up after their throats went dry and Lisa was nonchalant as ever. However, the moment they switched to Felix, they were met with a flabbergasting sight. Felix was actually copying the few small fish that he caught and threw them back to the ocean. While they were confused about the purpose of his play, Felix had already closed his eyes and switched his senses to one of the fish copies. Sigh. This twin-tailed fish's eyesight is really trash. Felix complained in his mind at the shitty foggy eyesight that made it impossible to see what's going on two meters in front of him. Better remove it. Just a waste of energy. The moment Felix made his decision, he only needed to think about destroying the copy and it would break into sand particles. Too bad, the energy spent to create them was lost forever. If it wasn't for so, Felix would have created hundreds of copies and utterly destroyed the balance of the game. Thankfully, his energy capacity was almost as good as peak second stage bloodliners due to his etching enhancement. Heck, everything that he copied so far didn't even waste 3% of his energy. Adding to the fact that he still had a SNES purified energy and he would actually be having more energy than anyone in the game. However, Felix had learned his lesson thoroughly from the third game and he didn't plan to waste even 1% unnecessary. Thus, he merely copied few more different species of fish and threw them back in the ocean to scout for the biggest clu.s. Ters of fish near him. After a few minutes, Felix spotted a school of half-meter long fish that had a stunning wide red back caudal fin and anal fin one. It was long and somewhat resembled Siamese fighting fish from Earth. 
They seem quite nice. Hopefully, their quality isn't shabby. Felix thought while gazing at the school through the eyes of a small golden fish. This one had almost a vision equal to humans, making Felix choose it as his best scouting copy. Disconnect. After giving off this order, Felix's senses were back to his body. He snapped his eyes open and held the paddles with both of his hands. He then speedily started rowing in direction of that stunning red fish school. Since it was quite far from the boat, Felix had to switch his senses a couple of times with the golden fish to check his pathing. A few minutes later, Felix stopped right above the red fish school and hastily casted his fishing rod into the water. He already pierced a green worm on the hook earlier to make sure that the school doesn't swim away from him when he stops his boat. Plop! The hook landed on the peaceful water and started sinking down and down until it was merely five meters above the school. Whoosh whoosh whoosh! Despite the distance, the bait was fought for by every fish in the school like they didn't eat for days. Lisa wasn't lying in the slightest when she said that the bait was modified to attract as many fish as possible. Naturally, the Alliance wasn't going to make fishing as hard as in real life since games were for entertainment purposes when it comes to the viewers. No one was that patient and bored to watch the players waiting 5 to 10 minutes just to catch one fish. For professional fishers who knew what they were doing, this duration would be further lowered. Too bad, the players were anything but professional fishers. Maybe one or two hobbyists but not outright professionals. That's because their profession was being an SG player first and foremost. Thus, the Alliance wasn't going to make it impossible for them to play the game by making them fish for real. Whoosh! After Felix felt that the line was being pulled, he started spinning the reel without feeling any resistance from the captured fish point one. He just kept spinning and spinning until the fish's head was exposed in the open. The moment the fish got outside of the water it started to jerk around, struggling to breathe. Felix merely brought it back on the boat and left it to kick as much as it wanted. He didn't worry that the fish would jump outside since the boat wasn't that small. Next. Felix repeated the same process of placing the bait in the hook then casting it in the water before spinning the reel in a couple of seconds, bringing a newly captured red fish. He threw it on the boat and repeated the sequence all over. Five seconds. A new fish. Five more. Another fish. His fans were delighted by the sight as they thought that Felix had lucked out on a CLU.S. tiered fishing area. They could see that other players weren't having the same efficiency as Felix. Some of them capture a fish every 15 seconds while the worst of them was getting a fish every minute or so. Knowing that Felix wasn't fishing alone, Emma and the rest switched their vision to his clones and noticed that one of them was actually pulling a fish every two seconds like he was in a speedrun. Seeing him baiting his lips as he kept reeling a fish after the other, the fans didn't know whether to laugh or cry. In what world was the copy better than the real? In a world where the copy lucked out on Felix's determination while the real Felix was fishing with a bored expression, clearly not giving it his best. T.I. Ring Congratulation on fishing 300 GP bundle, number dot underscore 5234973403099156 for visiting. Felix stopped fishing for a second and closed his eyes. His senses immediately transferred to a random copy and started inspecting his harvest. Looking at his half-full boat that was filled with multiple species of fish, Felix nodded his head in praise, keep it up F1. He then dove inside F1 memories and absorbed everything that happened since the moment he was created. Upon seeing that he didn't fish the GP bundle, Felix switched his senses to another copy. The process of reading memories and transferring was happening in merely a second. So, his fans never actually realized that Felix was using a passive and switching between his copies. Felix wanted to keep it that way as the fewer known passives the public knew the more abilities he would be able to use. Oh. So that's how the bundles look like. Felix opened up his eyes after he managed to spot the GP bundle in the memories of the second clone. The bundle appeared like a red pouch that had its strings tightened up. The hook was linked with one of the strings. Felix didn't manage to see one underwater like a fish even though he spent plenty of time looking for them. 
This made him guess that the pouches would appear suddenly on the hook if one was lucky. Keep it up F2. After lying down some cheering words, Felix switched to another copy in satisfaction. Alas, his delight in his clone's performance didn't last for long due to F3. He couldn't help but want to beat this bastard up as he had caught only ten fish. It wasn't due to his bad luck or fishing spot, it was because the F asterisker was busy torturing a fish by putting it underwater then pulling it up again in the air. It looked like he was trying to interrogate the fish about the whereabouts of its friends. Felix swiftly extended all of his senses to this copy and took full control. The first thing he did was caress the bullied fish gently and return it to the water. She suffered enough under the tyranny of his clone. In reality, Felix would never ever torture an animal. However, he would have 100% done it to a human for a swift result. That's exactly what the copy was aiming for, swift results. I swear they will be the death of me. Felix sighed in exhaustion while rowing in a different fishing spot. Line the string of the fishing rod. Real, the mechanical device for holding and spooling fishing line. The bulgy thingy with the pedal dot anal fin, the fin that was at the bottom of the fish. Caudal fin, the back fin.